Welcome to the podcast with Face, Pat, and Tiz. That can keep their same personas, to keep their same personas, and go from different federation to federation. You feel me? Like, what you mean? Regardless of how big they go. Go ahead. Like, yeah. like Undertaker when he came from WCW, his transition into WWF, he couldn't go as Mark Peoples. You feel me? He had to reinvent himself and go as Undertaker. Whereas Sting, when he went from um, Impact from WCW to Impact to WWF to anything, he was Sting. You feel me? And he kept the same persona once he got to that. That crow shit, and when he got to that black outfit and that, that black and white makeup, yeah, that was pretty much it for him. And he see, okay, who, whoever where you he go, you know what I mean? he go, that's that thing you get, and that's that same image and persona, like Ric Flair. When I was like, where Ric Flair went, he was styling, profiling. If him, I don't care how old, how young, NWA, yeah. WWE, WCW, even when he was Ric, ECW. You feel me? Like he was styling and profiling. You feel me? But like some people ain't got that that transition effect where you gotta change, you gotta change or come up with a new stick and you gotta be a heel like Triple H. When he came to WWF with that 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 regal shit, he won't really get that pop for that all that bowing and that all that old regal shit. Damn. But when he switched it up and he got with Shawn Michaels and he went that he that that Triple H, he really started taking off more. He had to I switch it up WWE somewhat. He don't want to talk about him, but I say another person <laughs> that was able to do that is Chris Benoit. Yeah, like he, yeah. he no matter. Like was even if, I don't care it if you him. called him the Rabbit Wolverine or Crippler Crawl. I don't give a damn what the name was. He was Chris Benoit. He was Chris Benoit, and he was a little nigga that was going diving head butt you and put you in a lock. Like he was a just he was the same person, he was persona. Like, I don't think he gets the amount of credit he deserves as far as being a groundbreaker for Federation and just being just an all-around champion that he was. He held so many championship belts. He may not have got to the level of a heavyweight championship until real, real late in his career. But a span of well, the shit he did and the factions he was part of, just just for him being in a part of, a part of the full horseman. I mean, that's, that's this still is in-ring so work. He don't get enough credit, to be honest. Oh, no. But it's no. because of his the way he ended. It mm-hmm. fucked up so much of like yeah everything else. It's almost like like Owen has almost been reduced to the way mm-hmm. he died and him hurting Stone Cold, but it's so much other shit that he was like revolutionary in, in the ring. Oh yes. That oh, yes. overshadowed because of that. But yeah. Mm-hmm. What up, Pat? What's going on to it? Right uh, to that to it. Get this like working. <laughs> We ain't here just talking wrestling. Yes, I hear y'all already got into it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, man. Talk about this good shit, man. I'm excited for this competition. This this conversation. Yeah, y'all. It should yeah, be yeah. a slobber knocker, as JR was saying. You feel me? You feel me? <laughs> just, okay, commentators. Oh, <laughs> top commentator. Who, who, who you got top commentator? <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, you know who I really like? I used to like um Michael P. A. Hayes. Okay. Him and Bobby okay. the Brain Heenan are like okay. two dudes are like they didn't have like super long runs, so a lot of people don't really associate them with the mm-hmm. announcing position, but they did so much other shit. But like as announcers, like they were really good, yo. I fuck with Gorilla Monsoon. Mm. Just cause, okay. just because of the voice and the knowledge he had when he talked about shit, he had a voice and a knowledge, yo. Like he just had that command. Of voice. Prestige. Mm-hmm. Exactly, for me, his voice just made you listen to him. And I'm gonna just give it to Jim Ross, man, because after all this shit, Jim Ross been through hell for us. He still right. commentated. I tried with not to go for the, for the default. Like Jim Ross is like the commentator. Like when <laughs> he's, he's the commentator guy. Right? <laughs> the first voice you hear in your head is, "Oh my God." <laughs> He He's killed the commentator him. God. He's a commentator God. Now, I'm going to give it to a wrestler that turned commentator to Booker T. I got to give it to Booker T just because I hear <laughs> Booker T. Yeah, is the part of so wrestling commentator. Era, I had kind of phased out and I had stopped watching wrestling consistently, so I didn't really catch Booker T. If you, you watch he still do it from shit, time right? to time. You watch that Shannon Sharp shit, right? Oh, yes, we Yeah. 
Booker T is a Shannon Sharp of wrestling commentator. Well, I do watch his podcast, so I can imagine kind of, but mm-hmm. I can't see him being his animated self and doing it. So I'd have to see that. But yeah. I, yeah. I can yeah. I can see where he would be a good talker. Like he, he's a good promo period. Period. So now, man, most Mine's of Jim I say Ross. Most okay, yeah, who else? Mine's Jim, mine's Jim Ross, Lawler, and Booker T. I was Lawler. going Lawler too. Puppies. I was going Lawler too. Yes. I was going Lawler. Lawlers too. But you know what? Lawler. Only Lawler during the attitude era. Yeah. Like that four year run from like 96 to 2000 when he was at his most vulgar. Like when they when they didn't have the handcuffs on him, when they were just letting him be this country dude from Tennessee that was just talking shit. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna take one further. It, it fit. Only, it fit wrestling was so Ross. well. Like that's what professional wrestling is. Just country folk talking shit. <laughs> only Lawler when he with Jim Ross. That's only Lawler I fuck with when he with Jim Ross. Mm-hmm. I like them. Too. Lawler, they had a very good dynamic. Mm-hmm. When Lawler with anybody else, he kind of like it feels like he carries everybody else. Exactly. Yeah. I only yeah. Yeah. do Jim Michael. Ross holds Michael home. somebody. It was another Michael, dude, Michael somebody. Michael Cole. Michael Cole. Cole. Yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't really fuck with Michael Cole, man. He was like, he was, he, he was he like, tried uh, too hard to be a. He. he was I a, don't he, like when commentators try to be personalities unless you are already a wrestler or somebody who was like exactly. somebody, and you come I, like if you just a commentator, sit your ass there and commentate. Put be, if you just a commentator, be a Tony Schiavone. Don't do nothing but commentate. Boom. Boom. That's all like, you do. Don't give me like no you. outside of the shit where you trying to get up and get in people's face and talk. Like, sit your ass down. Tony like Schiavone was a Nick straight Nick. cut, dude. I like Michael Cole now because he he played the, the good guy person now. Like, he, okay. he's defending the, the baby faces now. So he don't be all up in your, your, your face all the time. He's just explaining the storyline in the background. Oh, okay. good. Okay. He done faded the back. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, he's still like the main voice right now because he got the tenure pretty mm. much. And it's like a lot of young new guys, like this Corey Graves dude or whatever. But um he right now he just like he's pretty much the narrator, man. Going through or whatever. So damn much. He stopped it all up in the video. All up in the video. <laughs> Dancing, asking all the stupid questions and shit, trying to get on the promo. Shit. Um, who was the ball head dude from the eighties? Man, he passed away too. I forgot, mean, Gene. Uh, yeah, Gene. Mean Gene. That was my. Mean Gene wasn't a commentator, but he was the best announcer ever. Like his yeah, his announcer. interviews, announcer, his, his interview like, skills, interview. and his ability to let wrestlers just go. He and, was um, really good. I put yeah, it like this. Ran off or when they fucked up. Mean Gene has such a persona that they put this nigga on the cartoon. That yeah, is that's true. real. That's real. Yeah. That is true. That is true. Call the hotline. Who is the ref that always had like Stone Cold's back all the time? It was the old dude. I think he's still ref right now, man. But it's like a. It's it was a, he, he, got, he got a twin. Yeah, Earl, Earl Hebner, he the one that screws uh, uh, the screws. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's uh, two of them. It's a, he got a twin. It's Earl Hebner and Dave Hebner. Yeah, uh, one working in the back room. Work, work, work. They both used to be referees with that one working in the back. Mm-hmm. So y'all already said y'all uh, moves and stuff that y'all like? No, we ain't oh, get into no. the actual conversation. We were just talking What's wrestling in general, bro. Oh yeah, oh, okay. niggas, you, you know niggas just wrestling heads. Like, that yeah, shit, I, I, that I, sports, I, I, or music, or like, Shit like that, like random shit. Like I can go on shit like that. That's my childhood. Oh, oh yeah, video would. games I, and shit. Wrestling. I can go. I don't I watch too. I ain't too big on wrestling now. But I like I stopped wrestling, watching wrestling. I said it was five, six years ago, just because I didn't like the way it was going. And the people they were bringing out just the storylines. Mm-hmm. I couldn't follow the storyline, so I stopped watching it. And then I just rather like I was like, you already know when it comes to the video game. I was like, fuck wrestling, watching it. I'll create my own shit. You feel me? Because I got the I got the game and create the own universe I want to and just watch that shit and play that out. Just let it let the computer run on that shit. And I can just be like, okay, this the WWE universe I created. I can watch this shit, put whoever I want in and take it up. You feel me? 
So I used to hate the words. motherfucking characters you made, man. <laughs> Fuck Rick Haverty. <laughs> that nigga. And Barry Blackheart. And, and the whole Blackhearts. And Bubba Black or whatever the hell Blackheart you made up that day. Fuck you Rick Haverty, y'all. Uh... The angel and devil. Oh, oh that shit. Guy. They're making that nigga blue. Just that big boot nigga would. Oh, blue and green. <laughs> <laughs> Green had the Green had the running shoulder tackle. Nigga, tackle the fuck out your ass. That that's part of like where I got the idea for the topic today or whatever. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, WrestleMania is two weeks from now. Mm-hmm. And I was just thinking, you know, if I was to create myself as a wrestler, just like we used to in the game, what would be my main moves that I would Man, this good, man. What's up, guys? Welcome to the podcast. A show with three friends separated by distance, connected by brotherhood, having weekly conversations that you can join in on. And as always, I'm your boy Tiz, and I'm joined with sitting at a buck one fifty five when I'm actually eating something. <laughs> <laughs> Coming right. out the ring, and I still got that mean drop kick. But I can only do it once. It's the Padawan. <laughs> and I'm along with. What's that, man? It's your boy, Safe Place Face. What's going on with you? <laughs> <laughs> How you and Patty doing? <laughs> oh, oh, man. <laughs> Y'all, you know what, man? I listened to so much Patty LaBelle trying to get that video done, dog. <laughs> trying to find that right, just the right thing for her to say at the right moment. Uh, and I found that song, I was like, this is perfect. She or she 30 years ago made the perfect song. <laughs> to answer face. Only you knew. <laughs> if you asked me to. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, man. Uh, well, you know what? Um, I kind of oh, had a crazy God. weekend, y'all. I kind of had a crazy weekend. Yeah, I, I, I kind of had a crazy weekend. Um, yeah. The the. No, I'm, I'm, it was an up and down day. Saturday was was good. You know, me and the girl, we went out. We went to Hampton. And, you know, I don't know if y'all been to Hampton lately, but they where Hampton Coliseum is, they made it to, like, this fancy-ass town center area, mm-hmm. pretty much. It was real cool. Like, I, I like it's, like, mad shops there. It's, like, a movie slash um, bar plex there. And it's big, big ass target, whatnot. So, girl, want to go out shopping or whatever. I, she wanted us to dress up, so I dressed up and took pictures and all that other shit. Anyway, um, so we come back. I'm parking to the car, right? Shut up, shut up. I don't know what your smiles are saying in your head, but whatever is saying in your head, shut up. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, I'm so appalled. this this is the plot twist. We walking back uh, to the truck, parked to the side. This black dude got this weird looking white dude hemmed up on my car, on my truck, <laughs> on my truck. Mind you, mind you, we came back over there. Nigga using bags. your car to commit crime. <laughs> yeah. I, Mind Excuse you. me, sir. Can you put him over there? Hey, nigga, get up on get up on this nigga car. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, when I first had, got there, I parked, and it was like right in front of this like uh, like cigar bar, I guess you would call it, it's called Emerson's or whatever. Dude was there. Black dude was there. He was smoking a cigar. Oh, I, I, I thought it was. He seemed cool. Then made no mind to him. Whatever. So went to a couple of stores. Came back. Put bags in the truck, whatever. It's this crazy looking white dude just sitting on the street behind me. You know, I'm parallel parked to the side or whatever. So I'm like, 
I don't pay no mind to him. He's just sitting on the curb, just looking crazy and lonely and shit, like his girl done left him or whatever. So we put the bags up, went to the store, and then when we came back, that's when we saw the black dude I saw with the cigar. Him, him and up, crazy white dude. And I'm like, what the fuck going on? Before I can really assess what was going on and say what the heck I was saying, she screamed out, hey, get the fuck off my car. I was like, wait a minute, when that became your car? Anyway, <laughs> and she's going, I'm like, let me be the one to scream at this. You didn't even give me a chance to assess my anger so I can scream at these men. Or whatever. The police, look, the police was already there. They they come dude up. This random Asian dude just kept trying to talk to me, or trying to explain the situation. And this one, I don't know, this random black dude was there. He was like, Yeah, yeah y'all, y'all gotta. He kept just saying, like, you know, y'all can just get in the car and leave. Like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> or whatever. And the white cop told her to go go about her business or whatever. But I mean. And now it's like these three, it's like these two hard thumbprints on the, the side of like, you know, the bar right where the window goes down on your own, on your shit. It's just like this hard thumbprint in there. And I'm like, luckily that's like the only damage, but I'm like, out of all the cars, <laughs> you got to pick. And I mean, the black dude, he, I mean, he was like shorter than me, but he was like, Big buffed up dude. He was like ex uh, ex military. Used to be a police officer in Richmond, so he had to do hemmed up the proper way or whatever. And he apologized to me and everything, but I'm still like out of all the places. And I think the white dude he was on drugs or something. Like he he was like he the the white lady cop was telling me yeah he talked about he wanted to off himself and end his life and everything. He was in the Navy. I'm like okay. But can he end his life Glad black somewhere away from up and, oh shit got real like a deep yeah that's exactly what he was doing so that's why i wasn't really that you know spazzing but in my head i'm like all right uh i need to calm her down before we make this even bigger situation but luckily she she calmed down or whatever and i was able to talk in between pretty much but other than that it was actually a great day Okay. Yeah. But that was the, yeah, I know that was a random, adventures. yeah, random pad, a, a random pat story or whatever. But yeah, the, it, uh, the other random story is we went out to a hookah bar or whatever, and this random girl started twerking in front. Hookah. He went to a hoochie. Oh, I thought they said hoochie. That's what the fuck is that? What? Yeah. So a hookah <laughs> bar that she knew about or whatever. And the new DJ there, and then while she was sitting down, this random girl just started just twerking in front of me, and I'm like, oh, "It, um, <laughs> um, what was, what was that scene from Dave Chappelle? Bitch, my um, uh, my family's here. Bitch, my family's <laughs> here. What's your family do? <laughs> actually, she was actually she was cool about it because she realized the girl was just." She didn't know what was going on because the way we were like sitting, she was like talking to people she knew, and I was just chilling off to the side, you know. But she won't like twerking on me, but she was like, I don't know, near me, like, hey, if you want me to twerk on you, I'm right here. Just tap me on the ass, and hey, got you going. I'm like, mm, 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 I don't need this trouble. <laughs> there, you about to get your ass in trouble. Yeah, yeah, and that was my Saturday. And in the midst of all of that, I was trying to get edited again, <laughs> video editing and stuff. And yeah, <laughs> so but yeah, that was my Saturday. How y'all guys doing? <laughs> oh, I'm doing amazing. Uh, yeah, got a couple of vids out. Got another one about to drop tomorrow. Um. Feeling good about life. Family's doing well. Wife doing well. Work is going good. Uh, yeah, I, I, I honestly ain't got no complaints this week. That's life is good. Great. That's awesome. 
<laughs> that is awesome. Well, I've been on a a mental roller coaster for the past week. I can say that. Um, right now, I think I'm on the bottom part of roller coaster where it's about to stop. So I'm feeling great right about now. Um, but then, but them other loops and shit had me everywhere. So um, that was a very trying part of the week. Um, but I'm plateauing off. So I can say right now I'm real copacetic, fine. I have no problems. Um, finally going to the eye doctor tomorrow to get some glasses, get this vision right. Um, I need to do that. So, um, <laughs> oh, so I, I say I'm good right about now. Um, so let's get back into this wrestling conversation, man. Let's do that shit. Mm. Um, so, um, <laughs> so you want to start with dream matchups or top five moves? What you want to do? What, where you want to go with it? <laughs> I think. Well, me. I got, I got my top five ready. If y'all ready, moves to do them. Oh yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm I, I've been, I've been, I've been writing and writing since you said that shit. I've been, I got. I, I kept going. I, I, couldn't I got some honorary <laughs> mentions also. So if y'all got honorary honorary mentions, feel free to put those out. But oh, these are my favorite moves. Let's go. These are my favorite moves. Um, I want to start off with the choke slam from hell. Nothing says, nothing says, hey, I run this ring. Like grabbing somebody by the neck. Picking them up above you and slamming them right back like the fuck down on the mat. Nothing says period. Like boom, like choke slam nail, whatever. Um, the next okay. one is a little bit left field. Um, her Karan. I don't know what it is, but it's something about the dude just flipping, then using his feet to slam somebody down, spinning them around leave them all disoriented or whatever is always the move you never expect out the blue because they always pull that out of nowhere one of my favorite moves whether they do it a different way each time each person so but each time it looks kind of black submission move cripple across face now that i know that's the move we not allowed to actually say but that that bitch was effective (laughs) In real life and on wrestling. Mm -hmm. My next move is the RKO because that shit is effective anywhere at any time. Just period. Matter of fact, I would probably say that is probably my, I would say is the most effective move out of my list. And But my favorite move is the Stone Cold Stunner because it just has so many, so many classic memories to that it's like it's one of those moves even if you don't want to do the moves you're stone cold was always in a situation where like the the optimal situation like i want my boss just fired me and you'd be pissed off and that's every reason why you would want to do your particular finishing move on the boss that fired you you know what i'm saying now my honorary mentions um sharpshooter one of my favorite ones. Okay. Whatever. The super kick. Okay. Or uh, sweet chin music. Okay. Yeah. Be specific. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sweet chin music. Um, the clothesline from hell, depending on the person that's doing it. Cause that uh that one time JBL did that clothesline from hell, man. That I still remember that hit from this. I forgot who he did it on, but man, that dude flipped. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um spine buster and okay. i think one of the most effective moves in wrestling is german suplex depending on the person that does it okay i i, I that's a pretty solid list there um i guess uh i can i have two honorable mentions Mm-hmm. Well, I, my last five were honorable mentions anyway. So you All right, cool, cool. All right, so my honorable mentions is uh, they're honorable world. Mentions, not because they're not deadly and because I don't like them, because <laughs> not seen very much. Um, the mm-hmm. first honorable mention is when Lex Luger first came back to WWE after he had that motorcycle accident and he was not doing the torture rack, he was doing the steel plate uh, forearm smash. 
where he was mm. just knocking niggas the hell out with his forearm. <laughs> It's still the, one of the best moves in a wrestling game. Like they had a, uh, it was, I think it was, was it SummerSlam or was it Superstars or something? But he had this movie, he'll throw you to the ropes and he'll just like forearm the fuck out of you and just, he just flex. Oh, man. It, it man. was like, it was like one of the few finishes on that game that like, if you hit it, I don't care who was playing. Like if you hit that move, it was over. So I really like that, um, but he didn't do it for that long, I guess, just because I guess the, the gimmick wore off. But when it was, when he was doing that in WWE, he it, 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 he sold the fuck out of, he was knocking the fuck out of Nick. Um, I got a question. I got a question. Did you do that? Did you do that that move to like face at one time? Because he made that on the face video game. Yeah, said. on the video game. When we used to play the uh, game on uh, Super Nintendo, I used to beat him with that all the time. Yeah. Yeah, Paul. <laughs> God damn, Paul. I ain't beat him with nothing. Um, I used to win the matches with that move using that finisher. Um, but yeah, I digress. Oh, man. His, his face changed <laughs> all the way. To... Um, and then my other one because you only see it maybe like six times is the Emerald Flosion by uh, what was it, Murasawa or something like that, Mirawa. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Japanese dude. He was a Japanese dude, but he would like he only broke it out like. Like he would do like all of these other finishers, but if he broke that out, it was like a special match. And yeah. it's like that, it's like got a hundred percent kill rate. Like nobody's ever kicked out of it when he's done it. So like other people have like tried to move over the years since then, you know, because nowadays everybody do every finisher like it's a regular transition move. But when he used to hit that shit, it was over. But yeah, so those are my two honorable mentions. Now into my top five. Okay. Um, number five. This move would not hurt in real life, but in the world of wrestling, it is one of the most deadly finishes ever. And it has one of the highest uh, like kill rates. The People's Elbow. My favorite wrestler <laughs> of all time is The Rock. So, yeah. <laughs> like, Mike Felisa. But that motherfucker throw that goddamn uh, elbow pad and get the point which way. Hey man, that shit used to give me hype as fuck. That shit used to have me ready to run across my room and bounce off my bump bed. The elbow dropped the floor. Like it just gave me hype. So to yeah, uh, the people's elbow. To this day. Five. Um, okay. Number four. Um, I say this, I'm saying it, I'm calling it the gore. But I really mean anybody that do the spear as a finisher, I just like the spear. Like, it's one of the few moves in wrestling that, like, if you do that move in real life, you fuck somebody up in real life, too. Like, it don't matter how that move goes. There's no safe way to do it. It's just you getting shoulder tackled the fuck out of full speed hey, with no pain. And you eating that shit to your rib. So, like, that shit hypes me up as just a person that likes, like, contact and likes, like, aggressive shit and just, like... Go, bird. Like, I like that that the, the hand to hand like hey man this ain't nothing but my pure will and just force oh. that's fucking you up Bow! and and it just come out of nowhere because like the person is always getting up groggy and turning around into it like they're never just like faced up and ready like come mm -hmm. on you come on give it it's like no it's like hey do, do, do. Oh, oh. so like I just yeah Spears at number four um mm -hmm. Number three, um, it's a tie between the two people who's done it the best. My favorite personally is the uh, Rob De Van Dam version, the five star, but the uh, Eddie Guerrero version is beautiful as well. But the frog splash Eddie Guerrero. by either one of them two, just them two people's oh. frog splash. Like they're like, it's like poetry in motion is perfect. They got full extension. It's like a full pump. Like, it, it's if you conceive what a frog splash should look like, they do it to perfection. And I think their perfection puts it at number three. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Ain't poetry uh, in motion a move, too? That's a mm -hmm. hard move, ain't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Poetry in motion is a move. Um, number two for me, um, and this is another move that in real life, if you do it, it's on my, it hurts for real. Uh, the even flow DDT, the specific variation that Raven does, 
it's the oh. prettiest DDT in in like from such from a wrestler that a lot of people kind of underrate and kind of look at as like a slacker. The like, nigga. Jake the Snake already had done the perfect DDT. And then Raven came along and perfected that. Like the even flow DDT is DDT perfected. Like I don't care who else does it, it's not gonna be that. So just stop. Don't do it. Don't do that. Do something else. Um, but the even flow DDT is at number two for me. <clears throat> um, and then for me, number one for its kill rate, for its iconic status, for what it meant to this person and to wrestling and to the fact that like it really became synonymous with this person. Like a lot of wrestling moves and finishers are kind of interchangeable with a lot of wrestlers. Like a lot of people do DDTs, a lot of people do frog splashes, a lot of people do elbow drops, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people might do a power driver, but ain't nobody done the power driver like the tombstone power driver. For a power driver, which is one of the most dangerous moves to pull off in wrestling because it, it has the highest like accident rate. Like so many people has had careers shifted or ended off of a botched power driver. That should be Undertaker's man. tombstone <clears throat> power driver. You knew it was over when you saw him do it. As soon as he hit you with this, it it is synonymous with that character. You don't really see anybody else doing it. The only other person was his brother, Kane. <laughs> Kane stopped doing it after a while and just went back to his choke slamming days. Like it's it, it's just it has the longest standing run of just like devastation. And for one of the most dangerous moves, the person pulling it off has one of the highest safety rates with said move. Like you don't hear anybody saying that they got fucked up from a tombstone from Undertaker. Mm -hmm. And he's done it who knows how many hundreds of thousands of times between road shows and, and, and actual tapers. Like it's a science now. It is it, it is just one of those moves, man. So yeah. Number one for me is the the, the that okay. makes that makes sense. That Let's makes sense that Undertaker uh, will, will have the highest success rate because that's his one of his moves that he's he's sold on. So he got to protect that. Mm. So, oh, so not to interrupt. More honorable mention. <clears throat> Go ahead. The curb stop. Oh yeah. yeah, I love that shit. Like oh. I, I'm I'm with some fucked up like and insult injury like. It, some street fight shit, like we fighting outside for real. I love that move. Like, just come up, stomp your shit into the ground, bitch. <clears throat> Fuck you. Shit, bitch. I and if it's off the top rope, even better, goddammit. I, I hope it all falls the fuck off when I stomp it through this match. God dang, um, <laughs> Randy Orton's punt kick. That Randy too, Orton's I put punt that kick. in the same category, like, yeah. That. Yeah, yeah. And then, Damn. Um, Let's get into this. Now I'm uber specific with mine, very specific. Um, honorable mention, we're gonna start off the last ride, Undertaker. Mm. The move that um, everybody hated. Last ride. Everybody hated to take that move. <laughs> I, I can I can believe it. I can believe it. <laughs> now, um, next runner up mm. on the Rick Rude neckbreaker. Oh, just add insult to injury. I'm, I'm just gonna spin my hips, and then I'm gonna do this move on you. Just I'm gonna insult you before I injure you. So, <laughs> um, I'm gonna go next. Next runner up, the test big boot. Okay, that was the yo. Yep. Test was that dude. May he rest in peace. Cause then he passed. I, I don't even know. I, I got it as a tie between him and the bro kick for like the two most <clears throat> looking ones as far as like how mm -hmm. they how shit look, but test probably as far as like full extension, like in the way yep. I don't any of them wear nigga <laughs> with a big ass leg. <laughs> Yo, the one he did on K Quick. Yeah. Damn, to this day. 20 years, 20 odd years later, yo, I still remember that sound 
And me and, I think me and Face was on the phone with like, it was like probably one of them, like, it was like probably like 10 folk on the phone. But I just remember like, <clears throat> Face, you heard that shit? God damn. Like, I but thought those, that nigga was dead. Oh God. For those who don't everything. know. And I knew, K-Quick. I knew wrestling was fake, but I thought that nigga was dead as a donut. For those who don't know, K-Quick is now called R-Truth. Yes. <laughs> that nigga's for a new name, champ. Mm-hmm. No. Fuck your you further down the alphabet. But yeah, yeah, uh <gasps> test passed um in two thousand nine and um <laughs> over <laughs> oxycodone overdose. Some damn pills. Okay, now let's get into my my my, my top. I can't even say top five because I'm gonna go over five, but it's my top. Now <clears throat> I'm going the Arn Anderson version of the spine buster. Mm. Oh, he has the perfect spine buster. Yes. Yes. Oh God. Yes. You would, I, I don't know that he saw me move. I doubt that he was the first person to mm-hmm. ever do it. But like, he perfected that motherfucker. He does it better. He's like the even flow DDT. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, hell yeah. This. Now I'm gonna go the Paul Orndorff power driver. Okay. Pretty beautiful Paul Orndorff. Mm-hmm, just classical. Mm-hmm. Now it's a tie between these two individuals that do the same move, but I'm gonna go the moon salt by Kurt Angle and the moon salt by the great Muda. Oh, hmm. Buddha does a beautiful moonsault. Like it, it's all moonsault. Like, period. <clears throat> like he pauses in air when he's doing the back. Mm-hmm. Like it's like a yes. a float. Yes, like you know what? His moonsault is similar to like a backward swan time. It's like mm-hmm. it's like you almost think he's coming straight down, and then he flips it over. Like it's beautiful. Oh man, that's a good, mm-hmm. damn. I forgot all about that one. Now That's I'm gonna go wrong. just to throw it in there. I'm gonna go book a T and that spin a rooney. Let's go. I knew you were gonna say hold on the spin a rooney. That's not a finish, though. That's a that's like that's a, a I gimmick. Just, I just gotta throw it in there. Just just gonna throw I a book. Knew it. Man, a rooney don't get the hell out of here with that shit. I knew you were gonna <laughs> say it. I knew you were gonna read the one. Y'all. Now let's really back <laughs> to something serious. We're gonna go to DDT. <laughs> But we're going to go two individuals only with the DDT. Now, many people do it, but only two individuals do it to me perfectly. We're going to go Jake the Snake, but we're going to come right behind him with Arn Anderson once again, man. That Arn Anderson DDT won't mm-hmm. shit to play with. He's sneaking the ring, come behind you, Rick, you talking Rick Flair, snap your ass around DDT, he out the ring is over. <laughs> now. I can roll with you. You know no, what? Man. Since y'all said like moves that like won't work in real life, I got one honorable mention or whatever. Mm-hmm. Even though the guy that's doing it, it might actually work for him, but old school. By the other thing, when he walk on the ropes for no reason, no, but okay. show when oh, put him his arm down. If you don't get your ass down. Get your ass up in the room. And I, the now, whole time I be thinking, like, why didn't my he number move? one, my number one <clears throat> finishing move is the Sid Vicious Power Bomb. Ooh. His variation was like it, it, it was something, some added flair at the end. Some it, he when he did it, 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 it looked like it was intentional to hurt you. It meant to look like Man, it was hurt. He hurt a few people for real. Yeah, he heard Shawn Michaels with that shit. <laughs> no, true. <laughs> like, but but them my top, them, them my moves right there. But let's get into top five matchups, man. Let's really get into this shit. And I'll go first. I would love to go first on this one. Now, I, I, I did like I, like we said earlier. We're talking about if you're gonna make a matchup, people gotta be in a prime, man. Can't be no old version. Get somebody that's now, and that ain't gonna work. Because of course, the older version they ass whipped. Um, but we going my number one, my my first match. I'm gonna say is gonna go Bret Hart in his prime versus Sting in his prime in an Iron Man match. Hmm. Now that would be dope. That would be dope. Sharp shooter versus Scorpion Devil. Like everybody always wanted to see that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
and I'm talking Surfer Boy Sting. That that era, you feel me? When he was <laughs> on his new wave. Yes, that that thing. Now coming up right behind that one, I want to see Brock Lesnar and Sid Vicious in a no disqualification match. Brock Lesnar beat the shit out of Sid Vicious. Brock Lesnar beat the shit out of a lot of people. <laughs> The dog shit out of said vicious. Oh my god, that shit will get ugly. Now, oh, next one in a ladder match, I want to see the prime Steiner brothers, prime Steiner brothers against Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins. Ladder match, Steiner Live, Big oh, Papa Paul. <laughs> I got the Steiner brothers because back in there, early, like when they were real mm. time, they used to come out of them wrestling t- uh, leotards and shit. Like them niggas was hard. Mm. Like them niggas, yeah. were like, and they were so cohesive. Mm. Like they was a, a real tag team, tag team back when tag teams meant something like that. Exactly. They had all the titles. Yeah, thank you. At one point, they held the NWA, WCW, and the IGP titles all at the same they time. Yeah, they, they want no, they want no bull. They were the tag. They were the tag team to fuck with WCW. They, they, they were that epitome of greatness at one point in time. Now, I'm gonna go just, just cause I would love to see this one person get, get, get tortured in a match. I'm gonna go Cactus Jack against Hulk Hogan in his prime in a Texas strap match. Wait, which one did you want to get tortured? Hulk Hogan. Okay, he deserves it. Oh, he I've never liked Hulk Hogan. Oh, in your dream, all you gonna hear is, "Oh, that doesn't work for me, brother." <laughs> <laughs> Off on that shit, creative, creative control, brother. You know, that, doesn't, mm-hmm. that doesn't work for me, brother. Mm-hmm. I can't yeah. see that match mm-hmm. now. Never. Another match I would love to see is the Four Horsemen. And the Four Horsemen version I'm talking about is Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Chris Benoit, and Barry Windham against DX. The DX version I'm talking about is Shawn Michaels, Triple H, Road Dog, and Whatever his partner was, Bart Gunn, when he ever changed his name into Billy Gunn, and a, yeah, and into a, and, and either Hell in a Cell match or a Survivor Series type match. Be I believe I believe the Four Horsemen to pull it out. I believe because I just believe they gonna pull that one out. Now I had a, a dream tag team match. I got a couple of matches, but I'm gonna let y'all go to my dream tag team matches: Undertaking his prime and tagging with Sting in his prime against Lex Luger and Shawn Michaels. Mm. Well, it's funny that you said Undertaker in your last one because my first one is that. Um, so these are my five, and I, they don't really go in no order; they just kind of my five. Um, so my first match is. Undertaker in his prime, like in his prime dark madness against Sting in his first iteration of the Crow Sting. Mm. Um, I just feel like mm. just the interests alone would give like just me chills and just I feel like that like they both are really good wrestlers at big events. So like I feel like the match itself would like live up to the hype and be like epic. Um, and I'd be just interested to see what the storyline that they would go into to build up to the actual match. I feel like, I feel like for me, like wrestling was always about like the storytelling. Like I like the moves for sure, but like the storytelling behind it, like the the build ups to it, like it won't about Papa Shango and Ultimate Warrior as much as it was about the fact that Ultimate mm-hmm. Warrior was throwing up this weird shit because of Papa Shango. Like I want to see what the fuck go like. Get your get back, nigga. Like it, it's the build ups to these shits that like make it, you know, important to me. You know what I mean? So like, I feel like they'll do some cool with it, and they both just great storytellers in and outside the ring. So yeah, that. Um, my next one would be Kid Dynamite versus Chris Benoit in the Battle of the Flying Hair, but um, kind of one of the originators or at least one of the perfectors of it against the person who kind of took the torch in the new newer era. Um, plus they both were like undersized scrappy dudes that were strong as shit, but could really wrestle their ass off. So I feel, I know they were on a great show. Like they could wrestle a, a stick figure and make a, a, a fucking classic. So like them two together, I know it would be like crazy. Um, my next one, 
prime Shawn Michaels against prime Kenny Omega. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just, I, mm-hmm. just, like before Shawn <clears throat> got fucked up with injury so bad, like when he was able to really like go go and sell and fly, mm-hmm. like I just. The, the, the way them two sell and tell stories in the ring with their bodies and their facial but like that shit would be fucking epic. Um, I don't even care who would win. I just know like the lead up to it, the promos would be crazy, and the match itself would just be fucking awesome. Um, I would also like to see Prime Stone Cold. I'm talking about like. First year of 316. Oh, it's a 316. He was at his most bad ass of the 316. We just wilding the fuck out. Um, I would like to see him in a no DQ match against Prime Sandman in the battle. Mm-hmm. I was in the battle of like who's gonna get the drunkest and beat the shit out of each other with the craziest shit and like, talk the most shit like. I don't, oh, need, man. I don't need you think no like, promo, no lead up. Like, this could be a surprise match at SummerSlam somewhere. Like, just drop the intros and let these niggas fucking rock. Like, mm-hmm. you're a testosterone and me and two niggas beating the fuck out of each other for a good 30, 40 minutes. And I'm going to love every second of it. Um, and then my last one. Ooh, this is tough. Um, I, I don't. I hope I'm saying his name right. The dude that Kenny Omega fought like four or five times, uh, Kobayashi. They had like mm-hmm. six star matches. Is his name Kobayashi? Kobe. Uh, Kaya. It's some with a K, ain't it? Uh, I don't know his name, so but I've seen his matches. I've seen at least twenty of his matches, and he's like in my top ten. But I want to see him versus a prime Sabu. Um, Sabu, Sabu go away. I don't care Sabu what kind of match, biased. Um, but I don't want it to be no disqualification. I want to give Sabu some type of limitation, and I want him to actually follow. But I want to see like, him to just wrestle. Like I really like Sabu as a wrestler. Like when he's not doing the craziest shit, mm-hmm. I really like him as a fucking wrestler. So I think that'll be dope. And then my honorable mention, um, I never got to see it when it was happening, but uh, was a nigga named Hakushi. He used to spit the shit in his face, and he used to do the uh, he used to come out with, and he used to have the uh, tattoos all over his body. Yeah. I know you're talking. Oh, uh, Tajiri? No, nigga. No, true. Nineties. He had on the white outfit. I do remember the dude that had Akishi. tattoos all over. Hakishi or some shit like that. I know you're talking about. He came in all white. He had the tattoos all over his body. I'm um, Chinese writing shit. Oh yeah, that was a template on the game too. Mm-hmm. His name was Tenzuki Shinzaki. Jin Station Zaki. Um, he went by uh, hold up. Yeah, it was Hakushi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hakushi. So uh him versus the great Muda. Mm-hmm. I just want to see him and like and, like, and, and it's like uh mm-hmm. no DQ, so they can spit in each other's face and all that shit. I just want to see what colors they choose and like, like they had such similar like move sets. I feel like Hakushi was more of a power and Muda was a little bit more of a, like a speech, but like I feel like they would be a really good style class. I, I, Ooh, I got an honorable player. mention for your ass. Why? Now that you mentioned that match, honorable mention, um, finishing move, the great Muda, that brain buzzer he used to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a mean brain buster. Like, he was really dropping your ass on the head. Mm. He didn't even have to do the moon song. He got that right. Boom. Boom. That shit used to sound like that. Like, it didn't even sound like the rest of the moves on the mat. It was just like, boom. Like, you could tell that, oh, no, your neck is. That nigga just stacked your quarters, champ. Real nerdy. Mm. What you got, Pat? What you got, Pat? <clears throat> I kind of. A lot of them is like just matches I would love to see again, pretty much. Okay. But um, just throwing this out there, I would love to see a tag team Royal Rumble match or like a tag team all brawl Royal Rumble match. 
like I saw something like that not too long ago mm. or whatever when and then they had to face off with like Riddle and, and Randy Orton but I would love to see that was like just the prime like these the classic tag team from back in the day mm. and the good ones from now the current good ones or whatever all in one big one one big royal rumble or whatever team after team you know what i'm saying and especially with the dudley boys in there mm. the dudley, like the dudley boys gotta be like uh like a no no one even know that they came out like one of them last minute jumps or whatever mm. the dudley, what a, you know what i'm saying like i need oh, yeah. i need to come out like that and the same thing with like with the hardy boys or something like that i think that would just be classic pretty much um I want to see a WrestleMania match with Shawn Michaels versus Shinsuke Nakamura. Kick for kick. Mm -hmm. I just want to see that. Because I know Shawn, he's going to bring the spectacle because he missed the WrestleMania. And if y'all ever seen Shinsuke Nakamura and his interests when he come out in those big events, yo, it's just, it's a spectacle, yo. Like, and I just think he's dope. Pretty much him, him, or maybe Chris Jericho or somebody like uh, AJ Styles. Well, I've seen AJ Styles since just gave Nakamura a fight a couple of times, and them shits was great, pretty much. But that one, um, you said one of mine that Stone Cold versus Sandman. I was thinking the same thing. I was like, just just trying to match wrestlers with wrestlers that that it would fit pretty much so <clears throat> my next one is stone cold attitude era versus steve austin when he was in wcw <laughs> i want to see those titles like a more mm. combat stunning. Comet. Stunning. yeah stunning stunning versus the stunning stunner. steve, oh. stunning steve yeah. just for sh- yeah, shits and giggles <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Just for shits and giggles. Because I just feel like the old Steve Austin is going to want to fight that guy and beat the shit out of him anyway. <laughs> it's seeing him. Anyway. Um, I want to see Undertaker versus Goldberg, even though I'm, I've seen that happen. But it wasn't that... It wasn't big like it should be. And I want to finally see an Undertaker versus Sting. It was supposed to happen... It never happened. Hmm. Why it never happened? Brock Lesnar, which brings up my other matches. Anybody with Brock Lesnar involved in a WrestleMania match. You could literally put Brock Lesnar with anybody in WrestleMania. It's going to be a good match because all you want to be like is, are they going to survive? Oh, (laughs) yo, speaking of WrestleMania. WrestleMania dream match. They both come back to WWE. Daniel Bryan versus CM Punk. I got to see that. That. Uh, that would be dope. Them two yeah. together, it's gonna be an epic fucking that, that match. That would be dope. That's a lot of <clears throat> high level wrestling in the ring at one time. Um, and speaking of, when you said going back to, I wanted to ask y'all, what is your favorite match of all time? Like your one match that like, you go back to, and you can have one honorable mention and then your favorite, but try to keep it at two. That I'm gonna make that difficult. Mm-hmm. Shit. Why y'all thinking my honorable mention is uh, Hell in the Cell Undertaker versus Mankind? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was classic. <laughs> oh, oh, the other dream matches I wanted was like the Shield versus the Bullet Club. I just wanted to see that. Club will beat the shit out the shit. I just want to you see. You know that. they calling in about twenty extra niggas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be a whole lot of this, shit, buddy. Whole lot. Or of the Wyatts. Shit. Or the Wyatts versus. Yeah. Or, or the Wyatts versus Shield again. One of them. I, I just like. I, I, I would go. I would go the Wyatts versus Doom. Mm. Mm. Ron Simmons and Bush Reed. I'm taking it back, but that'll be a good matchup. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I would have to. My top match, just to get it out of the way, is Shawn Michaels versus Ric Flair in the retirement match. 
Oh, I remember that. It's yeah. the, not the, a feeling, it's not a one history. One match. <clears throat> not like storyline device or nothing, but like the actual match. <clears throat> All right, man. Don't call me a bitch. Uh, Tear hit the corner of my eye. When that <sighs> Rick was like, and super kicked the fuck out of him. Like, so at that moment, I really thought Ric Flair was done. And I hadn't watched wrestling in a minute, and that storyline had drawn me back that year to, like, actually catching and watching some episodes. So, like, I was kind of invested in it. So, like, I don't know that match, but that match to this day, like, the wrestling itself, the the eras kind of clashing of, like, Mm -hmm. the mentor, the mentee, the, the stakes at hand, the two niggas that just can sell the fuck out of any match, period. Like, they just... You're talking about two dudes that literally any match they in is going to be a damn near classic. Like, it's hard to have a bad match with them. So two of them, them two together was just, oh. it was just dope. But y'all got the floor. I apologize. Um, I'm going to say, man, I can't pin it down to just one match. It's like sagas of matches. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say my honorable mention is any match with between Sting and Ric Flair. And they heyday when they was battling any match they was in is my number is my mm. really, uh, um number one shit Richard thing shit mm-hmm. number one match I'm gonna have to say Steiner Brothers versus Nasty Boys. Mm. Yeah, it has some knockdowns. Because I prefer, I prefer tag team wrestling because it takes it takes more to work as a tag team than to do solo. Because you got to and the matches are the matches, matches are usually longer. Mm-hmm, matches are longer. You see a little bit more. It takes teamwork, you know, and when you have that certain chemistry and teamwork, mm-hmm. different moves flow. You feel me? So I mean, those two tag teams, as far as how ones were so technical and one was so rash and, and just raw. When they and they was in each other in WCW and they heyday and they was in, in each other, any match they went against each other, Nasty Boy Stein and Brothers, man, number one. I could watch any of their matches and just be entertained. That ain't a bad uh, list there. Pat, did you say yours yet? I don't think you did. Oh, uh, uh, nah, I would say all my favorite matches is any match when it's like. Stone Cold versus The Rock because they will always do each other's move and it was entertaining <laughs> with me. They will always just do each other's move, just piss each other off. So I like that or The Rock or Triple H because it's always a build up to it like who, who's going to get their revenge? Who's going to get their revenge? Or, or any match where Undertaker and Kane is in a tag team with another person or whatever. Like it's always like Undertaker Kane and Stone Cold or Undertaker Kane, The Rock, or somebody like that, whatever. Three man tag. Any 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 match where I'm gonna see all my favorite moves being done mm-hmm. <laughs> at once, whatever. But oh. I, I will right. I will say my favorite WrestleMania moments is when it's like the last match of the night or whatever. And it is also one of the ones that pissed me off too at the same time. But it's the last match in the night night. And then it gets all rowdy. Then all the wrestlers come back from the back. It's a big ass brawl or whatever. And then Stone Cold comes out the back and just starts stunning everybody until they get on the ground or whatever. Or at the end of the match, it's just or the one when they end the night where there's a big brawl at the end, but you never get to see it. The the end of it, they just cut it off right there, and then the next USA show come on. They used to piss me off. This shit used to piss me off. Like, what the fuck happened? Burn notice come on some shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yo, that dog used to piss me off, man. Fucking uh, <laughs> Would you say best storyline? Your favorite wrestling storyline. Uh, I know for me it's uh the original NWO forming. 
because uh, mm. for me it's like nostalgia because I remember sitting on the phone uh, with Face like watching that shit live and like it was the first thing in wrestling like we was always like kind of smart to a lot of the shit that was happening so like you know we read dirt sheets and shit so we'd be like oh that nigga you was just in Japan no. but like that was the first shit the way the way it was a weird time because like WWE was like at that time they was recording like a show and then another one would be live. So it was like kind of a weird, like mm. where you were still like, like you couldn't really tell when niggas was hopping because it was happening so fast. So it was like, is this shit real, yo? Mm -hmm. You're showing up, like, hold up. Like, this niggas, <laughs> like niggas ain't really get hip. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, it's a work <laughs> until we saw on WWE and they rolled out the, like the fake diesel and the fake, all right, all right, all right. Some corporate shit. These niggas really is <laughs> okay. But like before that, like niggas really couldn't tell, like if like the dirt sheets wasn't even really sure. Like, are these niggas still on the contract? I like what, what's happening here? And it was right after they had done that billionaire Ted shit. So it was like, okay, it's kind of realistic. Like these niggas just going rogue. Like, what is what's happening here? Then Hulk Hogan flip, and it was just like, what, well, who else gonna flip? Like, is everybody in NWO? What's happening? Like, what the fuck is going on? Like, that whole first year, it was a whole lot of, like, it was the first year in wrestling for a long time for, like, old school fans who had, like, kind of gotten used to the normal rigmarole, was, like, able to predict matches like shit. Like, up, 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 story beat, story beat, got you. Okay, yup, you about to do this. Okay, that's gonna be a twist ending. But, like, that was the first shit in a minute that was, like, <laughs> I don't know if this fake or real no more. Like when they threw that nigga Ray Mysterio into that side of that shit, that shit looked real as fuck. <laughs> like that lawn dart shit was apropos. <laughs> I, I was very surprised that nigga ain't sticking that shit like on the cartoon. Like, boy, I ain't. like it was a lot of shit going on that just looked like oh, shit, these niggas is fighting for real, yo. Like, this shit's about to get raw. Fuck the show. Ain't no pun intended. These niggas is really fighting. I think that's my favorite, like, storyline, like, from start to finish, like, because it's the only one that I, like, before the end of it, I wasn't able to figure out, oh, I know what you about to hit me with. Oh, here come the twist. Oh, I know it. Like, it was like, mm -hmm. oh, no. Face you know? Oh, guess they go ahead and watch this one. You see what happens. There you go. Shit. Me, I'm gonna have to say er, any early Undertaker storyline when he still had the, the mystique of the dead man. You feel me? Like mm -hmm. the that early mystique of all the lights go out. This nigga was walking. He had the real pale makeup before he started getting all the tattoos and shit. The you know, basket with his hand locked in it. Mm hmm Yeah, I think that was when I really thought I was like, I don't know, this nigga dead, but he damn sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know you feel that fucking casket though. I don't give a fuck who you is. Not you feel that shit locked, and I see the way you dragging it. it it's oh. heavy as a bitch for real. So even if it's like a hundred pounds, oh. nigga, that's. You just carrying that shit. Mm. Yes. Right. He had that mystique. He had a certain that oh my oh, niggas didn't know what was gonna happen. You didn't know what he was gonna do for me. And he had Paul Bear. Matter of fact, that was I'm gonna say before even he had Paul Bear when he had that the black uh, man. Mm-hmm. You feel me? Like well, back the then. had power over him. He was just dead. Mm-hmm. Just a dead man <laughs> from Death Valley. <laughs> That's all you knew. Back, back That's then, it. <clears throat> if it's a, and my runner up, my runner up, I'm gonna go WCW. Mm. I'm gonna go any four horsemen storyline. Cause I'm guaranteed to see Arn Anderson put somebody in that goddamn spine bust. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. That was, guaranteed. That was a go-to go sneak move. Hit you in the nuts, turn around, spine buster. Hit you in the nuts, turn around, spine buster. 
<laughs> ding dong, ding dong. And I'm gonna go. I'm, I'm gonna take it with. What's your favorite tag team, man? Of all time, let's pick get pick one. Get an honorable mention, but you gotta get that one tag team. Oh, I got you. Road Warrior. Call them by mm. Like mm. I straight up tell you, like in the ring, they was fucking dominant, and then a street fight, I'd take them too. I ain't talking about no LOD 2000 or no how the shit was <laughs> right, and no, no puke and all. No, I'm talking about the real Legion of Doom. Clothesline you the fuck off of the top of your shoulders, and we getting the fuck up out of here. We coming in, we ain't selling shit. We beating you the fuck up, and we going home. And we gonna yell at you. Oh, what a rush! Okay. And we get okay. the fuck up. Like them niggas was hard. Like that, they they was great as a tag team. They had what you want from like the more wrestler, like half flyer and hall. And mm-hmm. then you the animal come in and just give you the brute force. They finish a move was like one of the top is in the top three of all time tag team finisher moves. Um and they were believable as fuck. And they gimmick, like they gimmick was out of this world. Like, I don't know no kid that grew up in like 80s or 90s that watched wrestling that didn't want a, a pair of spiked shoulder pads like them niggas. Like, <laughs> one time, like. Even if it was for like a weekend, you wanted you wanted them shit. Gotta have them shit. Them on <laughs> like, it was just what you. It was just like them them shits. Like they had everything you would want. They mm-hmm. the old niggas because they was for real. And they was showing no pants and them shit. And then they appealed yeah. because well, of their gimmick. <laughs> like, yeah. Any honorable mention? Uh, if I had to give an honorable mention. Damn, tag team. There's so many great ones, bro. Um, if I had to give an honorable mention, though, I'd say, man, Edge and Christian, yo, they underrated as a team. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. They put in a lot of pain, and, and they revolutionize a lot. Of, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 Oh, um, well, you know what? I ain't mentioned my my favorite storyline, but I don't really oh, have one. Story Every, any revenge, I'm a sucker for a revenge story. So anytime they fucked up Stone Cold, he came back, the next thing you know, you see somebody walking down the hall, he grabs them from the top of the the, uh, the, the ceiling and stuff and fucks them up and drop them or, or anytime they mess with Kane Wong, I'm, I'm a sucker for a revenge story. I love revenge stories, but my favorite... My favorite uh, tag team is, I would have to say, is the Dudley Boys because I'm going to see something violent. I'm going to see something hilarious. I'm going to see somebody crash through a table at least once. At least once. They do not disappoint. Good tag team wrestlers, too. Like, they're just... Oh, period. The chemistry. Timing and teamwork, like, yeah, it's like perfected over the years, man. Right? Yeah, yeah. I like I like tag teams where it just it seems like it's all one motion. Like the whole match, it just seems like it's all one motion. They had it up, you know. They just setting everything up in in general or whatever. Don't really care too much for the like you know the tag teams that just seem like they put them together because it looked like a cool tag team. Yeah. Pretty much. But uh, I will say, if I was to pick one of them, I kind of like when Edge and Randy Orton was a tag team. Just because really? it just seemed like, well, Edge is, Edge is, is the, he wrote the book in tag team, like you said, too. So, so, and then you put Randy Orton at the right time. Randy boom. Randy is like the most. He's he's literally like actually if you want to be on it, Randy wasn't the perfect wrestler when it comes to professional wrestling. Like from promo to ab- abilities in the ring, can do literally any type of style of match. Um, can play a heel or a good guy. Mm. Like he, all he missing is like motivation to like actually want to do it. Like he he really just mm-hmm. kinda, he he a typical like I'm just. Good, so you know I do it. <laughs> we well, like third generation, ain't he? Second yeah. or third? Yeah, yeah. But like he, he, that motherfucker. That's a that's a wrestling nigga, man. 
Oh, you know what? I got another dream match. Okay. Randy, Randy and, and Brock. Because I don't think I've seen that yet. I don't think I see Randy and Brock. I think, I think and, they have a... And I think if they built that up, it would be it would be a big match. It would be a real big match. For real. Like, that up, but I think that happened. I think that yeah. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it probably happened in the past, but I would like to see that again. And if <laughs> yeah. I probably look yeah. it up later. But not I see my uh, tag team. Hey, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go honorable mention. It's a tie between tag team between the fabulous fabulous Freebirds and Arn Arn Anderson and his brother Ole Anderson when they were together. Ole, Ole, yeah, Arn and Ole, Arn and Ole Anderson, man, they was a fucking good ass tag team. That's my honorable mention. Them two. Now, number one tag team of all times. Uh. Mm. Fuck it, I'm gonna go Steiner Brothers, man. Like I, I fuck with the Steiner Brothers hard, man. Like ain't shit, won't shit like this, um Scott Steiner doing that hard come right off the top rope, man. One of the won't shit like one. Like, 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 yeah. Decorated like a motherfucker. A motherfucker did their thing. Every, every every federation they went to, they was good everywhere they went. You feel me? Like they won't went somewhere they was good, then fell off. Man, them niggas was decent. In real life, in wrestling, and then like exactly, they just was really good wrestlers. Mm-hmm. Guaranteed to have a good match with them. Collegiate wrestlers. And them and the Road wrestlers. Warriors had some of the most epic tag team matches ever. Oh yes, oh yes. Damn right. You know what's you know what some uh, epic tag team matches though? I, I would say Edge and Christian versus the Hardys because they had a mm-hmm. legit beef. And oh yeah, each ass. time, yeah, like it was a good, it was a good match, you know. Like Hardy's, I would say they probably are one of my my favorite tag teams, just off of nostalgia reasons and reasons. And really, I would say I got into wrestling. I don't know. I think I got back into wrestling when my brother, my younger brother, started getting back into wrestling or whatever. So that attitude era age is probably like. The main yeah. where I get the, my most m- memorable moments from, pretty much. But I'm gonna, see. I'm gonna end it with this one. What is your favorite promo of all time? Oh shit! <laughs> and I wonder if it's gonna be the same as that. No. <laughs> 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 That is my favorite. Oh my god. Um that one. Um, I'm gonna tell you, but like real talk, my favorite promo, if we talking like actual factual, is a uh, Dusty Rose hard time. Oh, oh yeah, you definitely is that is your favorite. <laughs> hard times, hard time, baby. The hard time you could get the road through hard times, baby. Yeah, that's my shit right there, boy. That's the road got that hard times, baby. Where shit? I'm gonna switch it. You took food. I'm gonna switch it up. House. See, I'm gonna switch it up because I I hate this person. I hate this person, but. I love the promos they did only with Mean Gene because of how they said his name. In the Hulk Hogan and Mean Gene Oakland promo session. Mean Gene, brother. Mean Gene, brother. Mean Gene. Mean Gene, brother. He said this nigga name like five times. When he's with the promo. Like, what's up, fine man? (laughs) Mean Gene, brother. Mean Gene, brother. Funny, uh-huh. I don't know why. That was so fun. <laughs> 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 oh, man. That was a good time. <sighs> oh, what time is it, man? It is 10.35. And <sighs> that means that it's time. Oh, shit. It is time. We'll have a day. Like for real this time. Mm-hmm.
Like dead ass serious. It's really time. Well, shit. If it's time, then we might as well get into it. Um, episode seventy. Good and fuck around. Fuck around. Good and fuck around. Fuck around. Yeah, this week uh, I blew the mic last week. Found out that, <laughs> and that was on the good mic. So, uh, you know, we on the backup mic right now. So, uh, can't keep it up. Otherwise, I'm gonna be on for my third mic. And, uh, <sighs> oh shit! Uh, <laughs> the mic wrecker, the mic destroyer. <laughs> yeah, man, I did. He calls you the mic. <laughs> Yeah, when I ran the mic when I ran record. back and edit, and then I played with the mic over the past week. I realized, oh shit, that's what happened. Like I yelled and that shit, and that's why they couldn't hear me after the shit. I blew the mic. <laughs> Doing too damn much. Jesus. Yeah, we. Mm-hmm. Pause, man. Let me. Yeah, I was Never waiting for that. I before that whistle. Sorry. Yeah, caught you oh, the mic. <laughs> Right. Well, you know, it was kind of a slow news week amongst all the random, you know, normal things that's been going on. Ukraine, Kanye acting crazy, <laughs> all that other stuff. Royce the Black guy gonna beat the shit out of Crooked Eye and Joel Ortiz. Did you see that shit? Did you see him on uh, Joel, Joel's podcast? Yeah, 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 he was pissed the fuck off. Yeah, Royce the Black like, gonna beat the shit out of y'all. Y'all need to leave that man alone. Yeah, he 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 seemed like he was. I don't know, man. The boy seems like he he always to me seemed like he's a man of integrity. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, he he just thought of that that looked like Tom Foolery. Right. That biggest kill for less. Hmm. Yeah, I don't so know I'm what they would think. Detroit's crazy as fuck. That's all. All of them too. Leave that nigga. Alone. Yeah. Leave, leave, please leave Royce alone. He ain't for the game. No play play. No play play. <laughs> what he I think he about to drop a diss himself because I heard something from his Instagram or whatever, and it sounded like some some real shit coming up. So we'll he see. He gonna see them. He said he's gonna see him. Hmm? Oh man. Yeah, it sounds like he gonna he 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 looking to shoot the fair one. Uh, one good uh-huh. time, one good time. But um, yeah. Um, let me get right into the the good news or whatever. Well, I guess it you know, I guess it will be good news in the in the future or whatever. But um, Anthony Mackey, uh, aka the Black Captain America, uh, he purchased twenty acres to build a production studio in New Orleans. So. Once again, we got a we got another. Hmm? He trying to be the next Tyler Perry. I love it. Yeah, yep, you beat me to it. I love it. So, which to me feels like um he's about to he's either about to get this, he just either got a check from Disney, because he's the new Captain America, and he's investing in it. And he said, Hey, if I'm gonna be the, the new cap. I might as well have my production studio here and y'all could just do scenes here or whatever. Pretty much. So or I, I, he just hmm? has business sense has invested his money wisely and he just rich as fuck and we didn't realize it because he didn't flaunt it. True, true, true. I mean he has been getting money since Papa Duck. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. On, on your left. <laughs> anyway. Everybody in the three one three. <clears throat> <laughs> and Clarence got real nice parents and they got a real nice <laughs> marriage right. and because of that marriage Clarence got into the army and he met up with Steve Rogers and all of a sudden they put some wings on that man's back <laughs> he's an Avenger oh man nigga nigga <laughs> Nigga, what if Eight Mile and Captain America existed in the same universe? 
In the uh, factory in the same world that Captain America had down running laps around the Falcon, nigga. No. Me technically. Eminem's was like made it to the military, got all of that rank, and got access to some fucking super wings. What? <laughs> Ten years after he is just out here getting beat the fuck down in a rap battle by Eminem. Man, yeah. <laughs> and then it was so bad. It was so bad. Thanos snapped him out of existence. <laughs> Good night. Is it is it past eleven yet? Is that what happened? Did we get the loopy hour and I didn't know? <clears throat> Almost, maybe. Almost there. Almost there. But um. Shout out to Anthony of... Pando for uh, being the next uh, the next great studio owner that's black. I like it. Yep. Like it. Nice. Like it. Stacking money since eight mail, but since you no know, eight mail, might as well bring it up. Um, because. Hey, it, it goes along with it. Ben Zeno. <laughs> ben Zeno finally ends his 20-year feud with Eminem. Um, it was a feud. I thought that shit was over like in 2004, 2004. <clears throat> something like that. Like, well, some I haven't heard Eminem or none of them niggas talking about Ben Zeno since uh the early or years. anybody niggas was wearing baggy jeans still. Or anybody. Period. So, uh, sir, you so, have feuded with yourself for uh, 17, 18 years. Uh, go to sleep. Go to sleep, sir. You know, some people, they have grudges. And then some people, they end up beefing with people. And the people he, they're beefing with don't even realize they're still beefing with them. Because ain't nobody. This happened to me before. Sir, you just trying to be a brother, man. Go, go take <clears throat> steroids. Sip you some creatine drink. Um... Make you some music that nobody will ever listen to, mm-hmm. and hang out with your friends in Atlanta sniffing coke. Um, mm-hmm. We ain't gonna act like, like we ain't about to do this. We ain't about to do this with you, this man. And stop fussing with your with yeah, your no, daughter. Right. You, sir. She's she's actually doing all right now. Stop fight, fighting with your daughter. No, she's. <laughs> no, <laughs> I like that shit. Yeah, you know, she got some catchy. She got some little bop. You got some bop. You got some little shit. Whatever. The car, you know, it catches your head. Oh, yeah. I guess maybe but I'll I'll give I'll give Ben Zeno leeway because I think I think the Eminem stands and stands still be bugging him from time to time. Well, yeah. So I can imagine. So I, a little annoying. I, I think this was, you know, him being older and saying, you know what, I'm I'm too old for this and I'm tired of doing dealing with this every single day. So I'm gonna just put this general message of to all Eminem fans and stands all over the world, the beef is officially over. I'm letting y'all know I have no hate towards any of his fans and I recognize his contributions to hip hop. He is truly he is a part of the culture and one of the best to rock the mic regardless of his color. Okay. That is you know what's going it. on behind the scenes. What what it, what what's happening? That's weird. They just mm-hmm. bring that out. What is he promoting? What's happening that he's trying to get relevant? Or what's what, some some is up? Something is afoot. I don't know, man. I think he might be coming to the light or something because he just remember I just said, y'all, you need to stop beefing with your daughter. And now I see he he actually apologized to his daughter. That makes sense. <laughs> I apologize. I want to just apologize to Coy, Nikki, everyone involved. I think they start getting all sentimental and start apologizing to everybody all of a sudden. And everybody, you know, I love you. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Either that or he realized his, um, his daughter is about to make some money, so he's going to be nice. And, yeah, so... He's saying he realized that him going back and forth with the fans is not going, not good for the culture or whatever. So, so. About time, man. It only took you like 20, 30 years to actually realize, you know, maybe you should do stuff for the culture that don't fuck up the culture. Man, <laughs> that, he is, he, that is shit. All of the whole feud and all that shit been in his head. Ain't nobody beating mm. uh, nah, that's, that's, that's his... 
Good advice. That's his only claim to fame, so whatever. Uh, more claims to fame and trying to keep his name out there. Uh, here's some fuckery. Keisha Cole is making a song with Antonio Brown. They they with put the, the song Brown. out with Antonio Brown. And maybe that explains why he's been around Kanye all the time. She's Repeat wild. what you said. She's wild. Keisha Cole. Believe it checks out. That fits mm-hmm. the brand. Yeah, that's what they say. Cat, uh, Keisha Cole, athletes, they get along. Um, I don't know. You take that as whatever, whatever that means. But um, Keisha Cole. I'm not her. Her and Antonio Brown got a song together. Of okay. course, Keisha Cole sounds great on her part. I didn't really make out too much of Antonio Brown's part of the song because I wasn't sure if that was him or not because, hey, I never heard Antonio Brown do anything musically ever. So, except Hang Around Kanye. It kind of sounded like it was Kodak Black. Maybe it was a song with Kodak Black and I mistaken it. No, he makes that that young that young teeny bop type. So it was probably- okay. Was probably really him. So uh, uh yeah, song all by himself that he released right after he did that fuck shit on the sidelines of that game. Mm-hmm. So and I guess he's he's using that to fall back on or something. We'll see how this goes. Well, he uh, we've uh, seen. If I'm not mistaken, he's the president of Donda Sport. Oh, true. I've heard that. Yeah, fashion. So I mean, he he got a couple. Of, he got his hands. He. I tell you this. If he don't play football again, he got his hands in enough eyes where he could be setting up for a nice little payday outside of football. So I ain't mad at him at all. But mm-hmm. doesn't surprise yeah, me. She, goes, she likes ghetto niggas. Yeah. Yeah. Right on brand. Or, or just niggas that's a little tad bit off. Just, just tad bit off. Like the hood shit, man. Yeah. She loves it. It, it. It's right on brand. It makes total. I'm not, and he's an athlete, so she's just going from the NBA to the NFL now. <laughs> Pretty much. Much. Next on the list, right? Fifty Cent says he's he's pretty much like done with stars or, or whatever. Well, at least for right now, he's he's back beefing with stars because his main beef. The more I looked into it, it makes sense. Is that stars take too long to green light his shows or whatever? Saying that they green light, he he has a track record that his shows are successful or whatever. And he hurry up and try to get these shows out so he don't so he can have it at a timetable that makes sense. But he says that because of them, he's not gonna have nothing out until another six months because. They are quick to okay shows like High to- um, High Town, but they like leave him in the back bar- burner. Even though his shows are the main reason why people are watching Stars right now. Matter of fact, a lot of people wouldn't even know what the fuck a Stars was if it wasn't for Power Ray. That's not a bad point. Um, I don't even know what to say. I, I think. He definitely has a gripe there. Um, he is definitely a like say what you want to say about Fifty, but his track record when it comes to like television and movies and stuff, like he is pretty solid. Like he, he's gonna generate revenue and generate interest in the shows and give you good ratings. So I don't understand what their hesitancy is. Like he's making y'all money. I, if I was them, I'd be like, okay, this dude is printing us money. Let's get this. Like I'd treat him like. Uh, Netflix tree Shonda Rhimes or you know like I have like a deal with him like that where like all right you just hey you got 10 shows you bring us in the next what eight years or whatever man you might as well say if you might as well say 50 cent is star at this point they might as well give stars to him because yeah. <laughs> yeah, like you green light if they're like censoring an episode or something but not like the show itself saying like mm-hmm. make you wait to see if we're gonna get a pilot and all like no 
Because, um, matter of fact, it was uh, it was a point of time where Comcast and Stars didn't have an agreement, and if they didn't make that agreement, whatever, they would have end up basically not having Stars on the lineup or whatever. And I kind of remember this because of my job or whatever. But I looked it up, and it turns out that Fifty Cent actually talked to Comcast, so they can ease the no no um negotiations with stars so his shows can be out on time because he would have if if they didn't have that deal that means it would have been like a good third of his viewership gone right and that messed up his money so that's crazy though like that he was part of helping them and then they're just like ah, we'll still make you wait mm-hmm. ah, boy. I feel like it's another example black of man uh, black man in America and corporate America not keeping up with the times. Not knowing, just looking at analytics and not actually looking at, which is, which makes no sense at this point. I, I, I feel like, because you literally have a system and an algorithm that literally tells you what people are interested in. Trending topics, hashtags, it's literally there for you. You don't got to do no groundwork. You don't even really have to go out in the field to find the, the ratings and, and, and stuff to back what you need. It's right there. You can Google it pretty much. So I, say, I put it like this. I say it's all about the actual power. They don't want to just give him the fluidity just to put shit out on, on command. So they got to have some sense of some power of telling him, nope, hold up, you got to wait. Because if not, in essence, what you said, he would be stars. You feel me? Like if he had free range to put out any show he wanted to at any time, any power. I mean, with no wait time, no nothing. Sure, the other shows may be put out a little bit quicker than his, but is any show instantaneous? No, the company still has to have some range of power. But it's another another way to view it too, because that's just an example of rich versus wealthy. You feel me? Mm-hmm. Even if it, even the rich man Fifty Cent got a boss, that he he still got to wait that they give him okay on something. So I mean, in essence, it's all about the power, in that it's the power structure. I, I I see it as he wants the ability and the power to put out his shows or have that green light to put out his shows when he when he see fit. But at the end of the day, it ain't about what you see fit because you're still an employee. True. Sure. But I I will I. I do like the fact that, well, the one thing stars, I don't think they intended on is 50 Cent being vocal, which is pretty stupid because that is 50 Cent's claim to fame, being vocal as heck about the shit he disagrees with. But, he's doing wrong. He's going to say something, he's going to be public, and he's going to probably make you look like an ass. So now at this point, if 50 Cent, if they want to, if they the stars doesn't watch it, 50 Cent can literally tell people, hey, I'm not going to be on stars. Not necessarily, he, if he wanted to, he could say, hey, bo- boycott uh, stars and everybody would get off. But he don't even have to do that. He can literally just say, I'm not putting powers on, on stars no more. I'm going to find somebody else like Netflix. And boom, that shit's over with. Yeah. That shit's over with, <clears throat> pretty much. So... Yeah, I I'm commend Fifty. Uh, he is beginning to be one of the black moguls that I look up to, like like Jay, pretty much the way he moves in certain things or whatever. But yeah, I just like to put that out there that Stars is doing the fuckery and Fifty Cent is doing the good work of basically putting that fuckery out there. Well, mm-hmm. hey man. <clears throat> Either either free him or free him, man. Let let fifty air rock out, man. He he he's actually doing some really good TV shows, and I can't hate on. It. I don't even watch them, but I I can tell by the response of the public, like it's definitely yeah. a phenomenon. <clears throat> you would think, okay. stars, man. Go ahead, and let that man make y'all some money. Yeah, my last thing I have on the fuckery is uh. Well, if you if you needed another reason to stay away from South Carolina, I got another one for you. Hey, 
All right. Okay. South Carolina. <clears throat> South Carolina has finished renovating a correctional facility and says death row inmates have the option now to be executed by firing squad. Ain't that a positive? Firing mm -hmm. squad. I heard like a long time ago that it was, I heard some like Tim Titrick were like bringing that back, but I thought it was like a myth or some shit from Texas. Oh, no, but, they got that shit. <laughs> whatever, but. All right. Um, shout out to the people on Death Row. <laughs> I don't even. I don't even know. Don't commit capital murder, y'all. Oh, it's just about. Uh, um... Get out of South Carolina, um, or whatever. Uh, now, if you've done something horrendous, you probably this deserve nigga, it. This nigga just said, just get out of South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> you seriously? Like, I'm mean, gonna be honest. Not to diss the good people of South Carolina, but what's in South Carolina? Clemson University. Um, I don't like Florida myself, but that's personal reasons. You said Florida. <laughs> I'm saying South Carolina. Yeah, I'm, part I'm of totally. that 95 that gets me home to Virginia. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but it's also that one part of the trip where you feel like we ain't at Georgia yet. We ain't at North Carolina yet. Like, yeah, <laughs> you're right. That is that feeling you get when you go through South Carolina. Because yeah. it's just that, that long last stretch I like, God damn. Uh, Can't y'all just call it Carolina? The whole thing. Y'all about they're damn near identical. It's like for real. Like if they just it, it's the same thing with Dakotas, like oh, <laughs> Dakota. Huh? You got the uh mountains, you got the uh Duke and UNC in North Carolina. You got the tobacco. You got uh, the baby. They got some deep clubs. They got some very clean cities. But yeah, North Carolina ain't got as much either. Kind of, you know. But when you think of when you think of Carolina, what's Carolina the first a Carolina? Protein. protein. Huh? Carolina got a protein. I should I should stop because this is gonna be a, a podcaster from South Carolina. They're gonna be like, first of all, Virginia ain't shit. <laughs> we don't have a pro team. I, I can say that. Well, I, I, I can say this about the Carolina. I can say about this about Virginia. Defended when they want to get defended. I bet they call Virginia ass in there. Um, well, the Carolinas can't smoke bud like Virginia can, so <laughs> <laughs> and if you do, if you do, you might end up in the jail where you can get the option of a firing squad if you do something bad mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, because it's still fucking legal down there. Yeah, it's definitely illegal down there. Yeah. It's in one of them Dixie Southern states. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Dixie. Hey, yeah. One of your Dixie states. What you said, the Dixie states? Dixie. Dixie state. Oh, my bad. D I X I E. Bruh, I was about to be like, what kind of state is that? What does that mean? <laughs> Word. All right. I'm going to even dig no further. And we are at the loopy hour. <laughs> yeah. It's a loopy. Oh, yes. It hit. And that's where I'm going to end the fuckery off at, at the loopy hour. Oh, shit. We are at the loopy hour. Well, Stay away from Carolina, folks. <laughs> Especially if you're from there. You got cannabis. Because uh, for our last topic of the evening, it's, it kind of gets serious. Um, <clears throat> I don't know whether we should have started with this or what. Um, but uh, yeah, man. My topic for the night is daddy issues. Um, all three of us have kind of unique situations with our fathers, uh, whether it be they're not there, whether it be we have two fathers, 
uh, whether it be, you know, we have a father that may not be biological. Like, we have weird dynamics. So, like, I feel like that affects all boys growing up. But I kind of just wanted to, you know, had to talk with y'all and see how it's affected y'all. Like, I know how it's affected me uh, and just kind of see how it's affected y'all. Uh, more for the, more for like, I don't know, I guess just the listeners, but I mean, I guess therapy for us too, but yeah. Man. Um, So I had a couple questions I wanted to ask y'all about y'all relationships with y'all fathers and uh, kind of just see where it goes. Um, so how did not having a father affect your transition to manhood? Uh, I guess that's for you, Faith, um, and me. And then, Pat, um, I guess your variation would be, like, how did having the dynamic of having a biological father and then also having a stepfather, like, how did that affect your, like, transition into manhood? And anybody can go first. Um, well, I'll take it first. Um, well, being having no male figure in my life because I was raised by my mother and my grandma, so I really had no male figure. So I feel like a lot of the stuff, manhood or man wise, I learned on my own. I've had to learn the hard way, or I just picked it up just from trial and error. So I feel like my transition was not as smooth as it could be on a learning basis. Um, a lot of street smart things that I feel like I could learn from a father, the type of father that I had. I feel that um if he was around or was did not pass away at the time he did, um, some of the life lessons I learned would not have had to been learned the hard way. Or I could at least been wary of them before getting into the situation and learning that lesson. Um uh, I, I feel that not having that person there in my later years it affects like how I emotionally deal with stuff or how I hold on to stuff or stuff I let go or how I go into situations because I was never groomed to see things a certain way you feel me so the way I see things in my in my mind is very skewed so I always double and triple think every situation coming in and going out of them. So I feel like not having a father around in my manhood now, it leaves me like second guessing a lot of situations, a lot of not situations, but decisions I make in situations, not knowing full wholeheartedly, all right, this is what I should be doing. This is what I should not be doing. So I mean, everything is like trial and error, I guess. Um, actually, uh, before you go, since yours is a little bit more unique than me and Faith, even, um, uh, go ahead because mine is just quick. Uh, for me, I know the biggest effect of, for me is like I had manhood taught to me in like inconsistent chunks, mm-hmm. and like a period since I didn't have my dad, I had my grandfather until I was about eight, and he kind of taught me some things. Well, I say, I not even so much he taught me, some, like he taught me some things like physically, like as far as like some, like how to, you know, hunt, how to, how to like, you know, do a reel and bait for fish and like, you know, how to do shit like that. But like, he taught me more from like my observation of him, but like I learned like a certain type of manhood from him for a certain period. Then there was a period where it was nothing, like just all me kind of figuring it out. Then there was a period of like, my mom would have a boyfriend and he'd be in my life for like three years. And then I'd learn a different type of manhood, like a more street vibe. And then it was nothing again. Then it was another thing. Then it was like, oh, this is all the wrong shit to be. You know, because my mom had a different boyfriend that was a, uh, a fiend. You feel me? So, like, definitely didn't want to learn nothing from that. So it was like, I kept learning all these pieces of manhood, but it was like in chunks. So it was like inconsistent and it was without a lot of the proper context. So it was like, I saw shit, but I wasn't able to put a lot of the puzzle pieces together until I'm getting older now. Like the older I get, the more of those things that I was learning in those moments is starting to make sense. Whereas I feel like my transition would have been smoother had I had like a, a actual dad there to just kind of consistently give me like 
All right. So at this stage, this is how this works. And this is what how this connects back to what you had learned back here. Remember that? And th you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it would have been a lot more pieces filled in earlier and I would have made a lot of mistakes. But yeah. And Pat, how, how did your unique situation affect your transition in that? Um, that's it kind of it's, what your situation was. I know, like, for me and Face, it was kind of pretty much just not <clears> having <throat> our hands there. But like, for you, like, what did that look like? All right. When growing up, my my dad and my real dad and my mom, they were actually married. Did not know this until I was older. But uh, then they divorced. But at that time, I was too young. And my um, how would you? I I think they the it it was before I was like in my mind I never knew they were married. So that should tell you how long ago it was when they actually got divorced. You know, <clears throat> so it, it had to be when like I was a kid or a baby or something. I don't know what he did to mess up, but he messed up. Whatever he says it, my aunt says it, and my granddad. Uh, my mom's side or whatever he didn't like them so basically i would have to sneak to see my real dad because where i lived um charlestown in portsmouth he worked there because my grandma was in charge of the the area so it was kind of like i eventually see him but it wasn't one of those things like how to say the him being absent or just popping up from time to time or whatever. And then my mom moving to Chesapeake and then it got to a point that I really didn't see him for like years, like probably about 20 years. I probably didn't really see him again until I was like 26. Like matter of fact, it matter of fact, I think y'all met him one time. <laughs> that was yeah. probably like the first time I've seen him in like 15, 20 some years pretty much so I really didn't have like from early baby to like maybe up to about middle school or third grade I really didn't have like a, a male figure other than my uncles and stuff like that so I had like examples or whatever but then at that time my mom uh her and my stepdad started hooking up or whatever and it was like late 80s and whatnot and to me this is just another person uh my mom like okay so he's cool so it really <clears throat> it I, just the simple fact that i wasn't his actual son i kind of think that naturally gives me a barrier or whatever mentally now i don't know how he felt or whatever he he basically just took me in and whatnot but I think I was the I can't even say to this day the word dad right you know what I'm saying I always <clears throat> and I had a talk with my brother and sister about it, I always found a way in my language to say something around the word yeah. to express it you always very cool. <clears throat> saying, but dad. Yeah, but I can't really say it. Like, it's a mental block, whatever. And I think the bad is, like, <clears throat> we didn't, me and my stepdad didn't really get, like, close, close until probably, like, my older years or whatever, because I started to understand things or whatever. Like, I couldn't, he was new to me in my life, so I wasn't, and I wasn't, accepting of him at first so that would hold up a barrier over if i'm listening to, to me you know what i'm saying like yeah. like i hear what he's saying but yeah i'm not it's is that you ain't my real daddy mindset in your head but not really you might have been to an extent it, but you weren't receptive <clears throat> yeah yeah and then, then I had my older sister or whatever. And he, she wasn't cool with him. And then that she put, you know, probably put thoughts in my head about how the way things are. And then after a while, it just, I just got grown being used to him <clears throat> after a while. So 
I would say at the time where you were just without guidance and being like in your old years, kind of got closer to your stepdad and at the same time reestablished a connection with your real dad. Yeah, but at the same way, I feel like it hindered me is that I probably could have got a whole lot more lessons and a lot more um, building in my own esteem and self esteem more if I had that father around all the time or whatnot you know what i'm saying so yeah. that was probably that was probably my like the little small knickknacks or whatever like uh what you would know or what you would want a uh male child to know by 18 right. i probably was getting like the refresher course in manhood between 18 20 21 or whatever okay. and by then i i screwed everything up Every goddamn thing. <laughs> um, I'm glad you said lessons. Um, that actually leads me into the next question. Um, what was the one or you know two main lessons <clears throat> not having your dad around caused you to miss out on or have struggles with um, as an adult? Um, no, I'll take that again. I'll go first. Um, I feel that my emotional intelligence suffered um, uh, from what I'm told about my father. He had extreme anger problem and I suffer with the same thing. I mean, it t- it's taken me a long, long, long time to get a grip on, on it and figure out how to redirect it and figure out and, and get a ha- real handle on negative emotions and stuff like that and, and feelings of anger. Um, at times when I'm upset, I, I, I feel very, very volatile and I'm just now able to get a grip on that before I make irrational decisions. Um, I feel that having or if having my father in my life, he may have could have helped me figure that out a lot early in my life being he had the same issue if him, but this need to handle that because who knows? But I, that's how I feel. I feel like that just an emotional intelligence suffers. Um, uh, you said too. So um, just how I deal with people. Um, I feel like I'm a real introvert, and I stray away from conversation and just conversing with people. Um, on a day to day basis because I didn't have experiences just on on being. How can I say? the confidence to to talk to other people will be outgoing. I think I suffer in that department because I didn't have that male element to teach me certain things about being self-confident or being more confident in self and how to carry yourself to a certain extent. So I feel like I'm, uh, I'm not gonna say shy, but I shudder away from certain situations or certain interactions because of that. So. Um, Pat, I heard that same question. Um, what is the one or two main lessons that not having your dad around caused you to miss out on or that have had caused you to have struggles with as an adult? Um, I would say my inter- my interactions with other men. Just as far as not it may seem funny because we're cool. And like this and the third, but like I was saying, I have when I was younger, I didn't have the like overconfidence that I had, you know what I'm saying? Like I I didn't have the confidence that I used to have or whatever. So I would still be apprehensive of like having conversation with other dudes or whatever. And then I wasn't like a sports dude. So that was another thing. When you have a father around, he gets you into other stuff that other boys would be into, like sports. I didn't have that. So it was always a weird, it was always a weird conversation talking to other males or whatever, because I wasn't like, I knew it would end up in a conversation about stuff that I would have no clue about. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like wrestling fighting, you know, action movies, stuff like that. Yeah, 
as soon as you get into maybe like the sports arena, I'd be like, yeah, I don't know what they're talking about. Uh, they just look like a whole bunch of guys in the same suits slamming into each other. It looks real painful. It looks really, really painful. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. So I never really had that 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 uh, camaraderie or whatever, or learning of other things that sports would probably teach men along the way, or like camaraderie, sportsmanship, or whatever. You know what taught me that? Fucking cartoons and and and, and fucking Batman. That's what the fuck taught me that. <laughs> so that that and the simple fact that all right, when you're raised, I had a stepdad and you know, real father. I I was able to actually know him in my life uh, or whatever. And I still feel like we're still similar as far as being raised, because majority of the time it was me and my mom, just like y'all. So with that, you know, living under your mom's or whatever, your mom's teach you things to try to be keep extra positive, believe in God, prayer and stuff like that, which is always good. But it's with with black boys, we really do need men around to give us a layer of reality. Not saying black women don't do that at all. I but yeah. Yeah, not so like like it's the same messaging. It's mm-hmm. given in a more art. direct, it, it's not like sugar coated. It's like coffee. Like a woman is gonna give it to you with creamer, sugar, mm-hmm. and it's gonna be in a nice mug. And you might even mm. have like some hazelnut or some 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 nice syrup to put in it. Make mm. it nice, and she might even put some whipped cream on top. Like it's gonna mm-hmm. be beautiful. Dude gonna give you like a metal cup, and it's gonna be straight black. Not even that. It's Not the even same that. Coffee. It's just women are gonna make you it get... flowery, and and the world doesn't make it flowery. So like, the black boys need to kind of hear that real talk sometime of like, mm-hmm. yeah, all right. So this is what your mama was saying, but this is how you need to hear it. I feel what you're saying. Not now. Don't get me wrong, and I, I feel like in my state when it when they hit when life hit me in the face they gave me the coffee with the plastic styrofoam cup and they put so much in it no creamer at all and they told me to get to work <laughs> that's basically what it feel like with me but don't don't get me wrong my mom was the she she told taught me one of the most important lessons in my life at age 10 and that was you are a black you're black. And not only that, you're a black man. So that means you're going to have to work 10 times, at least 10 times harder than the white boy that's not going to work as hard as you just to get some recognition. If anything, and the recognition is usually a little pat on the back just to get that. That's the main, she hit me with that at age 10, whatnot. But I feel like with that man around, I won't just get that phrase. I would get that straight up harsh reality of like, look, look at this, you know, look at this pretty much. Now, when, when I started getting close with my stepdad and reconciled with my real dad, that's when I got all the late ass lessons. Yeah. And then at that time I was already, well, I'm feeling it now, but you saying it confirms it for me. So. <laughs> Um, I guess for me, I think the, the, I guess the biggest single lesson, like I figured out a lot of shit kind of easily cause I was surrounded by male figures. So like, even though, like I said, I didn't have a dad, I had like other males along the way that stepped up and taught me little pieces that I was able to put with what I also mm-hmm. observed from like, by me being a year behind everybody in my grade all my life, like it gave me a chance to kind of see older dudes all the time. And that was, I was always around, I was always the youngest guy in my crew, pretty much. You know what I mean? So it was like- Same here. Always, right. So it was like, always like, all right, well, 
I may not know exactly, but I can kind of piece it together with what I do know, and then I can watch what they're doing and kind of figure it out. You know what I mean? So, like, but, yeah, um, I think for me the biggest thing would be, like, inti like intimacy with, 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 with women. Like, I struggle being intimate and affectionate. Like, I, I can be very loving and caring as far as, like, providing and taking care of and, like, doing things for but like when it comes to like having like just um emotionally complex conversations or when it comes to just like, mm -hmm. being, yeah. like i guess you would call it like tender or something like sweet like a more soft <laughs> version of myself i find it hard like i've always been told that like by almost every girlfriend or woman i've ever been with even my wife to this day like that i could be like a little bit distant like, and it ain't that I want to be, it's just, I really don't always know. I don't, I don't know. I just, I'm awkward in that realm, but I feel like mm -hmm. having a dad would have kind of given me those conversations that you need, like from a male perspective to kind of tell you like the ropes are like, this how you talk to your women. Like this is, these are like, I, I saw my grandfather when he was like already in his seventies. So by that age, a lot of the affection piece in their relationship had gone. Like you've been, like once you get past 25 years, y'all kind of just own, like y'all know each other. Don't me, don't get me wrong. If y'all still young enough to, y'all still getting it in, but it ain't like a whole lot of like soft moments necessarily mm -hmm. in public. You know what I mean? So I saw him doing stuff around the house for my grandmother, you know, my great grandmother, but I didn't ever saw him like, being affectionate. I had, I had him tell me like, "This how you have a. This how you do the tender moment." I saw the corny shit that you see on uh TV, but yeah. a lot of that shit, it don't feel <clears throat> organic to me. And I feel like having a like having my dad actually in my life would have like, like for one, like that's the man that's most like you as a man in this world, unless you have a twin or a brother, like a brother, somebody that's some another male that's directly blood mm -hmm. you know what i mean so like i just feel like i missed that and like i struggle with that to this day like a lot of my like i'm i'm pretty much an amazing husband outside of the fact at this point that i struggle to this day with like making them emotional connections past like like my wife knows i love her but i don't always know how to convey that in like the softer way you know what if that makes sense like mm -hmm. i'm not always able to like have them emotional conversations or just like have just those moments like without making it a joke or without kind of just being quiet and listening like, yeah i feel like that is a huge struggle and it's struggle it's been a struggle my entire life as far as my entire life with women um yeah, and I would also say, like, how to channel my aggression. Like, I feel like I went through, like, mm -hmm. three major phases in my life where, like, my first answer mm -hmm. was to go to aggression, physical aggression. Like, um, and I feel like having a dad there would have kind of given me more outlets to navigate that and given me more of a roadmap on, like, all right, I feel you, but this is how we actually can use that as opposed to you doing a bunch of dumb shit with it and getting yourself in trouble and then figuring it out later, like, oh, all right. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, kind of to end on a, a happier note. Well, no, I got two questions. First question, um, and then I'll get into the last one. Um, what is the one main thing that you teach or that you want to teach your kids that you ever learned from your dad? So, um, like, something that you'd want your kids to know or learn from you that your dad never taught you or that you never um, taught that lesson from? Um, I said it'd be two different things for me. Um, the confidence to be yourself in all situations. Um, and by that, just to extend, just to expound on that a little bit, um, don't let others' opinions sway your decision making on something 
for yourself. Um, it, it's one thing to have a decision or have another opinion in a group, in a group thing, but when something solely, solely on you and solely about you, someone else's opinion really shouldn't matter. So um, trying to teach them that I um, had a confidence to just do that as well. And just to know how to refocus anger when you get angry, um, when to be angry and when not to be angry, um, when it's good, when to use that anger and how to use that anger. So it's like being emotionally intelligent and really knowing how to use and deal with your emotions on a day-to-day -day basis. That's real. That, that is a huge thing, especially for Black men, but like that emotional intelligence piece of like, not even, I don't even know if it's using your emotion, but definitely using your behaviors when you feel emotions like to the to your benefit instead of your detriment. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of black men that's locked up right now just because of like that lack of understanding how to like choose a better behavior when you're feeling this, the emotion. You know what I mean? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Or even feeling, or even the acceptance of knowing that that emotion is okay. It's okay to feel emotion. You don't have to fake like you're okay. You can actually say, no, nah, I'm not. I'm a little sad about this. this. This did not feel good or this hurt my feelings and that don't make you no less of a man. Like, that's, that's huge. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing I do is uh, teaching my son that it is okay to be soft. Like, I try my best since that's what I'm working on to like show him moments where like I'm just being tender to his mom or like I'm just being uh, thoughtful or like we'll be out somewhere and I'll be like, come on, let's just pick flowers. Like, you know, like just little little stuff so that when he becomes older, he'll know that it's okay to do that and he'll have kind of like a roadmap of like, oh, all right. my dad used to do this for mommy or this is how dad showed up on Valentine's Day for mommy or, you know what I mean? Like, so I think that just passing that on and uh two like also showing him like that aggression piece like I'm really huge on like it's okay to have aggression in you but you got to learn how to channel that into an assertive behavior like you don't need to necessarily like like yes we teaching you how to box we we're, we're working on fighting like I, I get that but that doesn't mean that you have to like that doesn't mean you have to change who you are you're not a fighter so you don't have to be like this is so that you can defend yourself, but like there are a billion other ways that you could like diffuse a situation or get out of it without having to hurt anybody. So like, like teaching him early, like, all right, I know I can do this, but I also have this arsenal of these other 10 things that I can do right now. Let me choose one of these other things that allow me to go home free and without hurting anybody else or putting myself in a position to get hurt. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, man, I feel like that's the biggest thing with, with, with mine. What about you, Pat? What are you going to teach your kids that you didn't learn? Um, That's hard to say because it seems like all the stuff that I didn't learn, they're all rushing to tell me the shit now or whatever. Pretty much like, yeah, don't do that, son. Blah, blah. But I would say definitely uh, what they said is making sure that you know who you are as a person it's okay that you are that person because i struggle with that or whatever and fuck everybody who don't like that shit i want to be the asshole father like i want him to be arrogant as shit like just just because i didn't get the chance to be arrogant as shit as a child like i want him to be i don't want him to have him or her, I don't want them to have any type of doubts in their mind, whatever, whatever, my my whole, and hopefully when I get to that point, the main thing I would want to teach my kids is how to make a million dollars. As soon as I figure that shit out, swear to God, <laughs> that's going to be the first thing. Because my goal is generational wealth. So man, my start kids. Start on with the basics, man. Investing, saving, <clears throat> and mm -hmm. understanding the money market. If they get that stuff early and they understand what's happening, then when they become adults, no matter what route they choose, they have to understand it to make a million dollars. Cause they'll like, that's basically all it is. Once you get the knowledge on it, like 
the more and more I, I learn, the more money I find myself with at the end of every month. Mm -hmm. so I, think, I think it just comes with like just starting them early instead of starting them at 30 some when I started learning, starting them at, you know, four, uh, five, six. Yeah, you know, when they can read, mm -hmm. choosing certain type of books. Like, like my son right now, he's in a STEAM class and he's a coding. Like yeah, we did not have that. Right, but you're getting them into stuff like that now. Mm -hmm. Even if he doesn't become anything <clears throat> with that, any realm he go to, any occupation he go to, even if he start his own business, that's one skill he can transfer with him. And now he ain't got to pay somebody else. That's more money in his pocket. So already he's going to end up with more money starting off in that field than somebody else who may have to outsource that. You feel me? So like, it's just little stuff like that, man. You, you're you going to be fine with that. I think that's a very smart uh, thing that financial piece is huge and Man. daddy never taught me that and I wish I had a got those because the past few years have been eye open and the, what I said earlier about reality whatever elaborating on reality that's another thing um, and man, what was that? oh the other thing is <clears throat> uh, nurture your talent, you know, better your talent, better your craft, but don't just rely on that. Mm -hmm. You know, have to put some work behind it or whatever. Don't think that it's just going to naturally happen to or whatever. Don't, don't, don't get spoiled into that or whatever. Thinking that. I worked in the day they should <clears throat> talent without. Yeah. Because this was my thing. My thing was, if I be a good person, you know, the good things will happen or whatever. If I had the dad there, he would have been like, it don't matter if you're a good person. Shit happens. Shit happens. Uh, be more, and be a good person, but also be a smart moving person. Right. right. Absolutely. Brain. Or whatever, so. Brain, brain's brain. Um. So yeah, well that leads me to my last question, man. Um, uh, being the fact that we all had significant portions of our entire lives spent without the benefit of our fathers. And despite, you know, however they might have been or whatever reasons they had for not being there, if you could, what would be one thing that you would most want to do or say with your dad if you had that chance? Get your fucking shit together. <laughs> oh shit. Get your shit together and live your life right, man. You got a you got a kid, man. You got to fucking be there. You got to be there. It's the same thing. Most of these motherfuckers hustling now. Got to got to understand. I had to get the same shit when I was hustling too. The difference is, I had the the my father as a fucking remembrance, cause he won't do. So I know if I made the stupid ass decisions, I wouldn't be there either. So I chose to just stop everything I was doing. Pat can attest to everything I've done and did when I was doing everything I was doing. You feel me? Because he was right there, right beside me. Every deal I made, every whatever I did, he was right there. I stopped everything I was doing, so I made sure I was there for my kids. I can see them grow. You feel me? And I have the opportunity to teach them the lessons that I never got. So the one thing I would tell my father if I had the opportunity to tell his ass is get your shit together. You got kids, nigga. Um, Pat, do you want to go next or do you want me to take it first? Um, you can take it first. I got two motherfuckers I got to think about. Right now. <laughs> um, I think for me, man, um, I would, so I, I, the weird thing about me is like, I, I never had my dad like actually there um, he showed up one time for, uh, I had this thing called a botillion and he showed up for that semi-sober, put a sash around me, took two pictures and that was the breadth of our interaction. And then the next time we had a real interaction was when he was dying. The last week he was alive. And, uh, the cool thing is that I got to have a conversation with him and let him know that I forgave him 
let him know that uh kind of that I was a good dad and that, you know, I had just had JoJo or whatever. So everything was good there. But uh what I wish I could have asked him before he passed. Like I didn't know he was gonna pass so fast. So I like we had planned on having a conversation the next week and kind of talking more in depth. But uh I would love to ask him why Not my mom. Like, I ain't worried about him being together with my mom. But, like, why I was never enough for him to put forth the effort to just talk to me. Like, the hurt. that like, That's one hurt that I'll never allow my son to feel, that neglect of, like, you're in the house with me for hours on end and never say nothing to me. Like, I don't even understand that as a parent. Like, now that I have a child, like, I can't go, like, five, ten minutes without wanting to just say, I love you, son. What you doing, son? Come here, son. Give me a hug. Like, I don't know. It's almost like some, like, in eight. Like, he was born, and I was, like, as soon as he was conceived, and I knew he was a thing, when he was just a zygote, I wanted to be around him. I don't understand that. So, like, I don't know. I would just love to know, like, what, why, what was, what was going on that was that much that you couldn't even give me that? Like, not necessarily have been the best dad. Like, you could have still been an alcoholic. There's plenty of alcoholic dads that still had conversations with the kid. So why you couldn't even talk to me, champ? You feel me? So yeah, that'll be my other thing. <laughs> that face. Um, I would say. The funny thing about my dads, right? They both got the same damn birthday. The same exact birthday. And my mom acted like she didn't know what was going on. My stepdad is actually older than my real dad. Whatever. Weirdest shit in the world. Weirdest fucking shit in the world. But I would say to them, the funny thing is... It's be hard to remember. Mm-hmm. Funny as hell. I almost want to joke, huh, play a player, but I ain't gonna say that to my mom. <laughs> Not, but the main thing I would want to say is, why are you niggas so loud? You niggas is loud as hell, both of y'all equally. The same type of loud, the same arrogant type of loud. Maybe because they're on the same birthday, but they loud as fuck. My real dad, my stepdad is just loud as hell. I can't get no sleep around you. Why are you loud? Shut up. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I can't say that. That's what I would want to say. Next thing I would want to say. Um, this is, this is, I mean, this, this is some serious shit. Um, you know you're an asshole sometimes, right? This sometimes, sometimes you're a bit of an asshole. The shit that you say out your mouth, if anybody else was to say that to you, you would be pissed the fuck off. Is this to both dads or just to... Both, both, yeah. both, both. Blanket both. dad, it's... blanket dad. Both, both. The, the great thing about this is I can use the same template for both, just have different types of um, ways of doing it. Now, my... And then the other thing I want to say to my real dad, is, um, sir, I am 38. I am not five. You can't just be up and hug me like, like I'm five, all right? I am, I'm a freaking 38. Also, sir, I'm not soft. I will whoop somebody's ass if I'm pissed off enough. <laughs> I don't want to, because I'm not a fighter. Beat the hell out of me. I'm, I'm not a fighter. I'm a, I'm a chill guy or whatever. But my drop kick is mean, sir. So you, I want you to realize that I'm not I'm I'm not the same five year old little junior that you had before. You know, act like you know. No, so stop acting like you know. I'm that guy. I'm not so. I whoop somebody's ass if I have if I feel like you know. I don't want to go to that route, but you might get a chair to the face because sometimes I just feel like him and his brothers. Now, now my uh, um one uncle, uh, that uncle knows what I'm talking about. Now my one uncle, I'm cool with him. 
um, and my other uncle that sings. I don't want to I'm talk about him, but him and a couple other my uncles I feel like they think that I'm soft because they remember me as five year old little Juan, Padawan, before I was Padawan, and haven't seen me since then. So when this new nigga come around with the same name as that five year old Juan, they can they can only think about that child in the 80s. I mean, but I, yeah, so I say that to say this, that y'all can't be talking to me all kinds of funny, man. I will whoop your ass off. <laughs> now, other unks, I love y'all. Some of y'all, man, y'all, y'all be coming out your mouth wrong way, man. God bless y'all. Grandma saved y'all. And she's, she's away, rest her soul. <laughs> But that's what that's what I would tell them. Mostly shut up and I love y'all. Shut up. Shut up and I love you. Well, Faith, uh <laughs> do or say with your dad. Oh no, you oh, want to Oh yeah, all right, dog. Get it, get his shit together. Well, um get your fucking get your fucking priorities together. You got kids. Um, and the moral of this story, folks, is uh, you got daddy issues. You're not the only one. Um, mm-hmm. Fathers out there, <clears throat> know that what your your decisions will make an impact on your child. Have that in mind as you're making your decision. Be a parent above all else. Love your babies, man. Um, shout out to mine. Little junior tears, love you, kid. Um, oh, I would like to say the one thing I would like to do about the, uh, my two dads is uh, peace between them first, and two, uh, a business. Each one of them, I would love to have what up because real dad got a CDL and stepdad just support my fucking yeah. I like it. Mm-hmm. Maybe you should drop that gym off. I'll be trying to drop the gym off the time. Oh, and then my 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 real dad when he's not on a um on a road on a truck or whatever, he'd be trying to drop. I would say if I do a business with him, I would have to have full control and get my other uncle on it because he can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> just like me that's he's the main reason why i can't talk on this pod because he'd be saying that okay <laughs> yeah. andy can't hear this in the right ear so he can't he can't hear in one of his ears i could be like right beside him saying all kinds of stuff or whatever he ain't hear not a dang thing i said just running his mouth yeah y'all have <laughs> director of operations to handle something yeah. <laughs> Let somebody else be the baby. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nobody do that. Get my niece. Thing. Get y'all a figurehead. Get my niece. She don't want to be a figurehead either. Not mine. But, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. Um. Well, I guess that's a good a place as any. You know, what I'm saying to kind of uh, stop off, but uh, appreciate y'all for having such a. Robust conversation. I had been meaning to want to talk and kind of get that off for a minute, but uh, yeah, thank you, Face, for making that push today. Um, no problem. And uh, as a piece of motivation, I would like to say, Face, you are an amazing father to your beautiful baby. And Pat, all signs indicate that you are going to be an, an equally amazing father as well. When you have your children, man. Um, Get my spawn, my offspring to take over the world. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, nothing. That was nothing. It wasn't like it was a secret oh, plot. Make clones to take over the world or anything. I don't know what baby Pat is going to be like. It's going to be hilarious. <laughs> it's going to be hilarious. Oh, yeah. We're going to have to make sure all of the cousins are ready to watch that one. Cause that one, that and one, you're a great father as well, bro. Oh, oh, that that one jumping off the top of the roof. Talking about what daddy told me, I could fly. I believe it. No, I did not. I'm going to be the reality one. You can think you can fly all you want. You be dead. 
told me I could do anything, daddy. No, I didn't. I told you you could do anything in your room. Let me pack in your room. They're going to come in to their theme song doing all the single legs. You know what? <laughs> you know what? In in be in my future son says, fuck you. <laughs> my future hey, son will fight you. Fuck you. <laughs> yo, you can't give me a future fuck you, yo. That's fucked up. God damn. I heard I think I heard one of my sperm cells say, hey, damn, damn that nigga. <laughs> We beefing in the future. You ain't even got here yet. You already got a fuck you waiting. Nigga just gonna come out. Wah, fuck you, Tim. Oh, <laughs> uh, shit. Oh, man. Now, that's hilarious. Um, But yeah, man. Um, What ain't hilarious is y'all supporting this motherfucking podcast. So go ahead. Y'all to listen this far. Go ahead and support. Pat, I mean, Face, tell them how they can get the merch and the apparel. Man, y'all can go to the website. That's rtrayclothing.com. Y'all can go to the website. Yeah. It's rtrayclothing.com. Yeah. A-R-T-R-E clothing.com. Check it out. And I Get your merch. I would have made you proud last week, uh, Faisa. Uh, I made sure I did not spell clothing for him. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I was there like, you go. This spell. And I mentioned the promo code. I got you. There you go. I'm yes, put that promo code. Hit them with the promo code. Make sure they get the discount. Pod Squad 8-3. All caps. Pod Squad 8-3. All caps. If you trap it in and you just put one capital letter, you ain't going to get it. If you try all small letters, you ain't going to get it. It's Pod Squad A3, all caps. Say a little bit of money, man. Say a little bit counts. Say a little bit. Say a little bit. Say a little bit. Say a little bit. And if you if you email us, oh go ahead. I give you this one. If you email us, I give you the free shipping, the free shipping promo code. What's that? I'm about to email you right now. The podcast at gmail.com. The partners podcast at gmail.com. Get on that. Um, but yeah, um, and make sure that y'all are early and not late, like Pat, like Pat was on that alley you uh for the promo code. Um and go ahead and get right over there right now and go ahead and get you some socks, get you a hat, get you a hoodie, get you a shirt, what man, get you some pants, get you a phone case. Get you a it's getting hot outside. Get your beach blanket. It's it's summer. Everything on there. Get you whatever. Get your pillow and a beach blanket. But be ready. Eighty three or the partners this spring as the winter break as the weather break. Make sure that you breaking them out there with your drip. Get your partners or your AC eighty three merch. Artrayclothing.com. And as soon as you leave there, go ahead over to buymeacoffee.com backslash the partners and go ahead and you can support financially there by donating for a little as a dollar. Or you can become a member for as little as four ninety nine a month, and as a member, you get access to exclusive VIP perks like our Discord, which gives you exclusive behind the scenes access to us, game nights, fun members only events, access to unedited episodes that nobody else gets access to, and more. So please make sure you go over to buymeacoffee.com backslash the partners and donate, or consider becoming a member. And if you don't want to become a member there, but you still want to support on a monthly basis, you can become a monthly supporter at anchor.fm backslash the hyphen partners. That's anchor.fm backslash the hyphen partners. And for $4.99 there, you can become a monthly supporter and contribute to making sure that we are able to continue to bring you these conversations that you can join in on. Um, Yeah. Also, lastly, if you want to support while you're on Anchor, Go ahead and leave us a voice message, please. They free. And they allow your voice to actually become a part of the podcast. We love to hear your takes on our topics. Make sure you jump on that. Um, You can do that on Spotify or on Anchor.fm. So make sure you do that if you are a podcast listener. And then, once you've done all that, if you want to get in touch with us outside of the podcast, how can they do that, Pat? 
I ain't gonna miss this alley oop because I thought the other alley oop was some face, but it's at T H E P O D N A S. That's at sign T H E P O D N A S. And that's the TikTok, that's the Twitter, that is the Instagram. And if you want, want to find us on Facebook, it's Tiz Face Pat or the Pop. And guess what, y'all? All three of us can talk fast. It's the Virginia. So if you forgot all that, if we said it too fast, you missed something. Say yourself a favor. Just go to thepartners.com. Get access to all the shit we just said. One easy click. One easy click. One easy click. That's thepartners.com. And we have been the partners, man. Another episode in the books. We had episode 70 on they faces. And as we end episode 70, I've been your boy, Tiz. And I've been along with. It's your boy, the Padawan here. I don't got nothing fancy to describe myself this time, but I'm one third of the partners and I'm along with. What's going on, man? It's your boy, Face, final third. We out here. Indeed, baby. We about Yo. this thing, y'all. Um, Yeah, Um, okay. Tiz takes finally coming. I finally got the uh, formatting down on how I want to uh, start my first show. So that'll be coming this weekend. Um, be looking forward to burning early, continuing. Um, and yeah, man, you know we about to hit y'all with some crazy shit. I ain't no telling what the fuck Pat gonna chop up. And uh, we are revamping the live show. We just have to have time to actually meet and kind of figure out where we want to go with it. Um, but we got y'all. We heard y'all. I got you, Glow. We'll be right back at y'all very soon. And uh, in the meantime, in between time, we love y'all. And we about this thing, motherfucker. Peace, y'all. Have a great week. I'm Love y'all.